Good morning. Thanks for joining us. My name is Bill Banks. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism at Syracuse University. Our program this morning, the threat of foreign terrorist fighters at part of the ICT's World Summit to Counterterrorism, the Shifting Sands of Terrorism. I think, if any, of the programs over the uh, few days of the conference fit the conference theme, uh, ours does. And we have a, a distinguished and really uh, uh, credible panelists, a set of panelists to work through a series of very difficult challenges here this morning. Just a word about the project and its place in the conference and in the larger themes of counterterrorism. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be a part of the family here at ICT for now more than a decade. I began attending these conferences in 2005 and have attended every one. Since then, uh, beginning that year, uh, our program at Syracuse University established a partnership with ICT at IDC, uh, and we routinely work together uh, through exchanges of students, undergraduate and graduate and law, through exchanges of faculty, and through uh, conferences and workshops such as this one. So in fact, this workshop, the one you're attending now, is part of a series that we call New Battlefields, Old Laws. That title was developed in 2006 as we sat here in Israel in August and September of 2006 witnessing uh, the attacks during the Second Lebanon War and the difficulty that the IDF had in responding to those attacks uh, without being accused in the media of violating the laws of war and going at civilian targets where the terrorists were hiding. The United States at the same time was confronting a parallel set of problems to those when it confronted terrorists to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and in other locations. One of us, I'm not sure who, I don't think it was me, I'm no good at titles, came up with this clever title, New Battlefields, Old Laws. So indeed, there is a challenge to fit asymmetric warfare and attacks by non-state fighters into a conventional paradigm of armed conflict. We sort of start from that difficulty and we work forward to talk about accommodations of the new battlefields to what might be thought of as the old laws. What reforms are required? How may the new and changing dynamics of conflict be fitted within established legal frameworks? And to what extent must those frameworks be adapted to accommodate the changing environment? I think of all of the topics that we have addressed over the decade, and there have been many, we have two published books under the new battlefields, old laws rubric, uh, dozens of articles, blog posts, a number of workshops and conferences in the United States and here in Israel. Today's event is perhaps the most apt or the most timely in light of current circumstances, the problem of foreign terrorist fighters. So we have speakers who really have uh, represented the, some of the best work on this subject uh, from around the world and uh, my co-conspirator, Professor Daphna Rishman Barak from ICT, will introduce the panelists and we'll move forward from here. Daphna. I'm the smallest. You'll have to raise it again after me. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is more than a pleasure to open yet another a new Battlefields Old Law uh, workshop. Uh, as uh, Professor Banks just explained, this is the product of a rewarding and precious relationship with the Institute for National Security and Counterterrorism at Syracuse University. And I'd like to once again thank you, Bill, for your trust and your friendship, because we share it both very, very dearly here at ICT. Um, at, at this stage, I'd like to spend just a little bit of time to introduce the um, distinguished members of our panel this morning. This panel is actually very multidisciplinary and international. Uh, we'll try to present security and legal issues arising out of the phenomenon of foreign fighters uh, and provide quite a well-rounded um, 
uh, review of, of, of the issues, some of the issues that arise. So our first speaker this morning will be Professor Peter Newman. Um, Peter, Professor Newman is Professor of Security Studies at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. He serves as the Director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, which he founded in uh, early 2008. He also co-directs the MA Program in Terrorism, Security and Society at the Department of War Studies, and he serves as Adjunct Professor at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. In addition, he's led research projects and written influential policy reports about issues such as online radicalization, prison-based de-radicalization programs, and terrorist recruitment in Europe. Um, the most recent, Preventing Violent Radicalization in America, was published in June 2011 uh, by the Bipartisan Policy Center in DC, uh, where he served as a visiting scholar. Um, so P Professor Newman will be providing the open opening lecture this morning, focusing on the threat itself and some of its ramifications. Our second speaker will be Dr. David Sharia, who is a senior legal officer and coordinator of the Legal and Criminal Justice Group at the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, also known as CITED, of the UN Security Council. Prior to this posting, Dr. Sharia was invited by Columbia Law School to uh, become a National Security Law Scholar in residence. From 2000 to 2005, he was the first senior um, deputy at the Supreme Court Division in the Attorney General's Office in Israel. I, during that time, he also served as the chair of the Interministerial Counterterrorism Committee and as a member of the Experts Forum on Democracy and Terrorism at the Israel Democracy Institute. Um, this morning, Dr. Sharia will relate the experience of the Counterterrorism Committee in dealing with the threat of foreign fighters, obviously of primary importance. Our third speaker will be Professor Nathan, Nathan Sales. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law, where he teaches national security law, administrative law, constitutional law, and criminal law. Uh, before he came into academia in 2008, um, uh, Nathan was the first Deputy Assistant, Assistant Secretary for Policy Development at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He headed the U.S. delegation in talks with seven countries to implement the new security measures and was also the Secretary of Homeland Security Special Envoy to South Korea. He will share with us this morning the U.S. perspective on foreign fighters. Then we'll have the pleasure uh, to hear Professor Gregory Rose, who is a professor with the School of Law at the University of Wollongong in Australia, specializing in international law. He's been a visiting fellow at ICT, a visiting fellow at the at INSCIT, also in Syracuse, and at the Asia Pacific Center for Military Law in Melbourne. Um, and this morning he will, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, present Australia's perspective on the issue of foreign fighters. Finally, I will have the honor of concluding this session with a presentation on the YPG, uh, actually on the YPG volunteers, which I like to refer to as the good foreign fighters. For those of you who do not know me, um, I am assistant professor at the Lauder School of Government here at IDC, and also I head the International Humanitarian Law Desk at ICT. So without um, further ado, I think uh, Professor Newman, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. And uh, I was given half an hour, which is a lot of time. Normally, people want me to stop after about 10 minutes, but I will try to do my best to fill those 30 minutes with meaningful content. Um, I'm very happy to speak about your Security Council Resolution 2178. I think nearly everyone on the panel has been involved with this in one capacity or another. As uh, David remembers, I was actually brought in by the US mission to the United Nations to advise um, on this Security Council Resolution. Here you see a picture of myself briefing the 15 ambassadors on the UN Security Council. In fact, that was followed by a presentation to David. I'm showing you this n not only in order to show off, also that, <laughs> but I'm showing you this um, because the presentation I'm going to give you now is pretty much the same presentation that I started the conversation there with. So you get pretty much the same content that the 15 ambassadors got last September when I was in New York. And 
These are the topics I want to briefly touch upon. First of all, it's important to talk about how many and where they are from. Then, of course, the most important question that I'm always being asked is, why do they go? There's no simple answer. Um, and the third question is, who inspires them? This is more or less about the internet, but I will cut this short and talk a little bit about the recruitment pattern. And finally, I will talk about what, what sort of threat they pose, especially to Western countries. And the reason I can talk about these areas is because at ICSR, my research center at King's College London, we started looking at this two and a half years ago. One of my colleagues noticed that some British fighters were going to Syria, as it was then, and were actually remaining active on their Facebook and Twitter accounts, and it became quite easy to follow them. Actually became quite interesting, exciting to follow them, because that, what they were doing was pretty much like publishing a, a diary of what they were doing on those, on those battlefronts. And so from two or three of these fighters, we started looking for others, and we ended up finding seven or 800 Western foreign fighters with their social media profiles, which we have collected now. At some point, we realized that this enabled us to actually talk to them. And so by now, we have had contact with nearly 100 of the seven or 800 that are in our database. In addition to that, as you will find out in a second, we've also done field trips to the border with Syria, where we've actually met foreign fighters face to face. So the first question is, how many are there? And it's very important what Daphne said, that what we're looking at are really Sunni foreign fighters, Sunni opposition foreign fighters. We're not looking at Kurds. We're not looking at Hezbollah. We're looking at Sunni foreign fighters who are members not only of Islamic State, but of Sunni opposition groups. And as you can see here from those credi credible estimates, some of, them, some of which are ours, the numbers have risen quite fast and in a short time. There were essentially two spikes. The first spike was in the middle of 2013 when you had the chemical uh, attacks uh, on, uh, by the government of Bashir Assad on, uh, on opposition forces. And when you also had the deployment of Hezbollah, that mobilized a lot of people to go and participate in that conflict. And then you had a second spike, and that was last summer, summer of 2014, when the so-called Islamic State declared its caliphate and had a string of military victories. During those periods, you could really see the numbers going up. But of course, 2014 is also significant because during 2014, you had the first wave of people coming back to their home countries, and I'll come back to that issue in a second. Here you have a map that shows you arguably very incompletely where fighters are coming from. Now, that is based on January 2015. The numbers are now uh, significantly higher. But I'm putting this map there in order to make two or three points. The first point is that the majority of foreign fighters still comes from Middle East and countries around 60% are coming from Middle East and North Africa. But significantly, around 20% of those 20 to 25,000 that have gone over the past three years are coming from Western countries and specifically Western Europe. And if you then look at a breakdown at the top here of the Western European countries, you can see obviously that the largest European countries are affected most strongly, France, UK, Germany. But the significant piece of information here is particularly the smaller European countries that are disproportionately affected. So if you look at a country like Belgium, for example, which has a population of 11 million, which has produced almost as many foreign fighters as Germany, which has a population of 82 million. So you can see that countries like Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, are very disproportionately affected. And this is an important facet and fact to keep in mind as I'm continuing with my presentation. Another important point is if you compare the mobilization that has taken place uh, in relation to Syria and Iraq to previous conflicts in which Muslim foreign fighters were mobilized, this is a table that was produced by my colleague Thomas Heghammer 
in an article for international security, you can easily see that there's actually only one conflict that comes close, and that is, of course, the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s, which has produced up to 20,000 fighters. However, during the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s, that number was reached over an entire decade, whereas we have now even exceeded that number in only three or four years. So you can easily see that whatever the exact figures are, and this is not a hard science, the Syrian-Iraqi conflict has already caused the greatest mobilization of Muslim foreign fighters since 1945, surpassing even the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s. And that is, of course, significant because the Afghanistan conflict in the 1980s is always being held up as, if you want, the beginning of the internationalization of global jihad as the cause and source for all sorts of terrorist networks like, for example, Al-Qaeda, which essentially recruited from former foreign fighters that were participating in that conflict. Osama bin Laden started his career in international terrorism as a foreign fighter in Afghanistan. And for many Western countries, and we're looking mostly at Western countries at my center, for many Western countries, the number of citizens and residents to have gone to Syria since 2011-12 exceeds in many Western countries the combined totals of foreign fighters in all previous conflicts. And that's, if you want, even more significant because Afghanistan mobilized mostly Arabs. There were very few Europeans who went to Afghanistan in the 1980s. And that explains why the numbers now, especially in Europe, are so significant. In countries like Belgium, those 440 are larger than the numbers not only for any single previous conflict, but for all of these previous conflicts combined in the case of that particular country. The question is, of course, why do we see this mobilization? What motivates people um, to go to Syria and Iraq? And this is something that now draws on our study of the Western foreign fighters that we have looked at in our research. It's very clear that for a significant number, especially of Westerners who are going, there are, if you want, secondary motives. And you can see that very, very clearly, especially amongst the younger people who are going, who are looking at pictures like this, or this, or this, and who are essentially seeing the greatest adventure of their lives. And this is not something that I'm saying in jest, or because I'm not taking this phenomenon seriously, but that's because how they perceive the idea of going there. Essentially what they see is people like themselves who are very strong, who are very empowered, who are fighting for what they believe is a good cause, and who are having the greatest time of their lives. And to someone who is perhaps 18 or 19 years old, who sits in a suburb of Paris, doesn't have much of a prospect in his life and career, perhaps has already had troubles with various law enforcement agencies, this is weirdly empowering. It says to him, you can be a hero. You can be a hero in that society. People like you who you were hanging out with six months ago in the banlieue are heroes in that society. And perhaps your friends have already gone over there. In fact, during 2013, there was a hashtag campaign on Twitter, which was called the Five Star Jihad, where fighters themselves were tweeting out pictures exactly like these, illustrating and articulating the narrative of the strongly empowered, heroic fighter who goes over there and has the time of their lives. But there are, of course, more political motivations as well. In the first wave of people who were going over there during 2012, 2013, one particularly strong, the principal narrative that was being articulated by recruiters was the idea of defending your brothers and sisters against existential threat. So they were telling potential recruits that your brothers and sisters are being raped, slaughtered, exterminated, and killed by a Shiite conspiracy. 
led by Bashar Assad, supported by Iran, supported by Hezbollah, and no one was helping. The Americans weren't helping, the Arabs weren't helping, the Europeans weren't helping, and people were being told if being a Muslim means anything to you at all, then you have to pack your stuff now and come over here and help your brothers and sisters. It was a very simple narrative, but arguably uh, a, a very effective one. And in fact, if you read David Mallet's book about foreign fighters, who has actually looked at foreign fighter mobilizations, not only in the Muslim world, but across time and in different sort of ideological contexts, you will see that he actually concludes that this defense against existential threat is a principal mobilization narrative in almost every conflict in which foreign fighters have appeared. And we shouldn't be surprised that that was a strong narrative that appeared at the beginning of the conflict. But then, of course, it changed. And the arrival of the Islamic State, you know, we always now think Islamic State has been there forever. It's barely been there for two, for two years. And only last year, really, did they create the so-called caliphate and had that string of military victories. And this idea of creating the Islamic State, the idea of the caliphate becoming a reality, and the string of military victories that followed the declaration of that was something that attracted another wave of people who were going there, and that was another strong recruitment narrative that was deployed, especially during 2014. And arguably, the people that were attracted by that narrative were more extremist to begin with than the people that went during the first wave. And this is also something that is quite different in the case of the Islamic State, different from previous foreign fighter mobilizations, because this is not only about mobilizing people to fight. This is about mobilizing people to create a society. And that's why you see different people going there, because the Islamic State in its propaganda not only tells people come here and fight, it says come here and build the utopia. So if you're not a fighter, that's okay. If you're a nurse, if you're an engineer, if you have particular skill, you can come over here and build the society with us. And that's why, for example, we see women going. Women cannot fight, but they have all sorts of other reasons, perhaps, to want to live in that utopian society if they're attracted by it. And that's an important aspect of the Islamic State. And then there's, of course, this idea of the West against Islam, which is becoming stronger again since last summer and which is becoming a more prominent narrative. Enabling factors are, of course, geographical proximity for Middle Easterners anyway and for the Europeans as well. Uh, Syria, realistically speaking, is really one uh, budget ticket flight away to Turkey because 99% of the foreign fighters enter via Turkey, continue to enter via Turkey. And uh, <clears throat> when we went down to the border, me and my research assistant here on the left, or my colleague, uh, Shiraz Mayer, and we were meeting with fighters. Um, it was uh, in places like Rahanli or in Kilis or in Antakya, um, at least last year, uh, until mid last year, it was absolutely no problem at all to meet with fighters. We were sitting in Antakya in the coffee shop and it took about five minutes until we saw the first fighters walking around. Every taxi driver in Antakya and Rihanli can tell you what B&Bs they are staying in. Every taxi driver can tell you where they are praying. And if you're still not lucky, you can go to one of four or five uniform shops in Antakya where you walk in and the guy asks you what group are you with and you say ISIS and he gives you the ISIS uniform. So it was certainly not our sense that the Turkish authorities were cracking down on this at all and I'm very interested actually to uh, go back at some point soon to Turkey to see if anything has changed. But for me, it's absolutely obvious why a lot of fighters are going via Turkey, because as long as they are not walking around flying the black flag, they will not be harassed by the authorities. And that's been absolutely important for the Islamic State and for other militant groups to have that open border and to have that essential sanctuary on the Turkish side of the border. Now, um, let me briefly come to the issue of recruitment before I address 
the threat. I'll skip over a lot of this. What I want, the, the key point I want to make here is that peers, friend, uh, friendship relations are still important in radicalization and recruitment. We're, I think, getting a little bit carried away with the internet, and a lot of people are talking about radicalization and recruitment on the internet by the Islamic State. There may be a little bit of that, but I would actually go against conventional wisdom, and I would argue that there's a lot less of that than we imagined. They're all on the internet. There's no doubt about that. We know that. We've been following them for three years on the internet. But that doesn't mean that their radicalization is caused by the internet. They're documenting a lot of this stuff on the internet. They're using Facebook just I, like I presume pretty much everyone in this room uses Facebook, but that doesn't mean that they were radicalized by Facebook. If you look at the patterns of where people are coming from in Europe, for example, and I'm talking only about Europe, you see these clusters in Germany, for example, Wolfsburg, Dienstlaken, Solingen, in England, Cardiff, Brighton, Portsmouth, in Belgium, Mechelen, Vilvoorde, a tiny, tiny little suburb of Brussels, uh, that has produced over 50 foreign fighters. If this was about the internet, that wouldn't make any sense at all, because the internet is everywhere. So if the internet was the principal reason for people going, you would expect the patterns to be even across countries, but they are not. They are clusters of people, and they are clusters of people because people know each other. People went to high school with each other. People played in the same football clubs, or as the Americans would say, soccer clubs. and. What happens, the typical recruitment pattern, is that two or three people go over, and here's why the internet is important, because once they are over, they can still be in touch with their friends back home, and successively they bring over their peers to Syria and Iraq. That's the typical pattern that we see everywhere in Europe. Here's one example from Germany, the so-called Wolfsburg Zell, which has by now actually recruited 20 people to Syria. Two or three people have returned. And there's this group of 40 supporters who are back there. We know that because they've documented everything on the internet. We can see the um, cafe where they were meeting every day because they were posting after pretty much every meeting. We can see that they were in contact with other extremists in other cities. We can see through Facebook how they were linked to other people in other cities. And we can see how they knew of and approved of other people going um, to Syria and uh, Iraq. But the principal pattern, at least in Europe, this may not be true for other countries, but at least in Europe, amongst the people we're looking at, is still very much a very strong one based on peer-to-peer -peer relationships. There's one last reason why this is true, and, one last re and that last reason is the fact that the Islamic State, if anything, has become more paranoid about um, infiltration and spies within its own ranks. And we actually talked to some of the people who are bringing people into Syria, and they told, and we asked them, if someone turned up with you and said, you know, I just got radicalized over the internet, I, I, I thought I'd come here and join ISIS, um, they unanimously told us that they would have practically no chance of actually joining the Islamic State. What you do need is so-called taskia, you need a reference. You need to have someone who's already part of the group who you can reference and who can then basically give you uh, a recommendation and who can vouch for you. And this is becoming, if anything, more important than it was a year ago, and that makes it even more difficult for people to just turn up and want to join that group. Now, finally, let me briefly talk about the threat. Now, the way we think about the threat is as follows. First of all, um, between 10 and 15 percent of the foreign fighters have already died, so they will not pose a threat to anyone. Um, others will move to the next battlefront whenever that conflict ends, and of course that is completely unpredictable. Many are back already. In most European countries, between 25 or 40 percent of the numbers that I've given you are, have already returned to their home countries. So, for example, in Belgium, you have 150 who are back. In Britain, the government speaks about between 250 and 300 who have already returned to 
Britain. So of the Brits, the British number that is always being mentioned between six and 700, perhaps 700 plus now, maybe there are still 200 people actually actively fighting in Syria and Iraq. Most of them have either returned or have died. So the, the actual numbers of people currently on the ground fighting with ISIS and other groups is actually significantly smaller because the numbers that you always hear and that I've given you at the beginning, the 25,000s, they are conflict aggregates. They are counting everything together. Now, this is, of course, what everyone is concerned about, um, people who are returning and who are then um, threatening or actually are trying to attack um, the homeland, as they say, in the United States. There are two credible studies of this, uh, on this. One is by Thomas Heghammer, who said that basically of his sample of 1,000 returnees, one in nine actually subsequently, after returning from a foreign country, became involved in, um, in terrorist attacks. And then there's another one by Yit Clausen, who basically came to a higher rate, one in four, 25%. So if completely unscientifically, you now say, okay, um, there's quite a divergence between those two, but if those two are perhaps marking the boundaries, the upper, the, the lower and upper boundaries, you can probably say that perhaps in the end, between 11 and 25% are going to be dangerous. The good news is that a majority of them will not become terrorists. However, given the scale of mobilization, given the numbers of people that have gone, there is obviously a threat. If you have 25,000 people who have gone to Syria and Iraq, and even if you take the lower number, if, even if you take the 11% number, that still means you have between 2,500 and 2,800 terrorists at some point in the future, which is, of course, a massive problem. And the important point here, and this is backed up by, uh, by other studies, is that those that do become terrorists are going to be more dangerous terrorists. For in fighter involvement, this has been proven in study after study after study, makes terrorist plots more viable and more lethal. If a foreign fighter participates in a terrorist plot, he brings military skill, he often is brutalized, he brings international connections, and he makes that plot likely, more likely to succeed. And of those that do not become terrorists, depending on where you're coming from, 75 to 90 percent, some, however, have mental health issues. Some are traumatized and pose risks to society regardless of their ideological motivation. And so here's what I see as the threat specifically to Europe in the next 10 to 15 years. They are, of course, returning fighters. Fighters who return as attackers or, in fact, as recruiters, I think, if anything, if the Afghanistan experience of the 1980s is anything to go by, that is as significant a problem as the actual uh, direct threat in terms of attacks. And I always talk about the three and a half Ds. So there are three and a half uh, groups of people that we are likely to be confront confronted with. The first group are the ones that I would categorize as not necessarily ideological, but traumatized, the so-called disturbed. And they, of course, need a different response from other kinds of returnees because they pose a specific threat. Then the second group is what I just talked about, the dangerous people who remain involved in terrorist networks and who are potentially plotting attacks. Um, and the third group are what we call the disillusioned. And we've seen a number of them, especially people who came during the first wave, who went to Syria because they genuinely thought that there was a genocide going on that they wanted to defend the Sunni people of Syria against, and who now believe that the conflict has turned into something else. And they are often coming back, they are not necessarily model citizens, but they are certainly not interested anymore in remaining involved in this kind of activity. And I do think that we need to construct a different response for that third group. But I think by now, the largest segment of the returned foreign fighter population are what I would call the undecided. And these are stories I hear from intelligence services in every country in Europe. A lot of people who have returned who basically keeping a low profile and where it is very difficult to tell what their intention is, their long-term intention. We shouldn't be surprised about that. A lot of 
Afghan returnees after the 1980s didn't immediately decide that they wanted to be part of Al-Qaeda and bring down the World Trade Center. It took some years for them to make up their mind. They blended back into their societies, and they got mobilized at some point down the line. And that is probably true for the majority of people who have returned at this point. So whilst eventually I think most people will be in one of those three upper boxes, right now I think the majority of people who have returned are in the fourth box, the, the third and a half D, the undecided. Now, um, just briefly because William has already signaled to me that I have to shut up, um, here, here, are, here are the two other uh, problematic categories that I want to talk about in terms of the threat. We are very focused on the fighters. In fact, when you look at all of the, or nearly all of the attempted attacks in Europe since 2013, with the exception, of course, of the attack on the Jewish Museum in 2013 in Brussels, which was carried out by a foreign fighter. But Practically all the other attempted attacks were not carried out by returned foreign fighters. They were carried out by enthusiastic supporters of the Islamic State who had never traveled to Syria and Iraq. And whether it was the attacks in Ottawa, in Sydney, attacks on Christmas markets in France, on the, on the kosher supermarkets in January in Paris, on the synagogue in Copenhagen, not a single one of them was a returning foreign fighter. But all of them were enthusiastic supporters of the Islamic State. So as much as we're focused on the foreign fighters, we also have to look at the people who never go to Syria and Iraq, but who are actually in tending to carry out terrorist attacks at home. And then, of course, what I consider to be the greatest, the greatest risk in the long term for European societies is that this sets off, if you want, a vicious circle where you have attacks by jihadists, you have a far-right backlash, which again then provokes the jihadists into more attacks, and you have strongly polarized societies um, that will actually change the nature of the sort of democracies that we live in and make it especially difficult for minorities to live in European societies. And of course, this is something that we have seen after Paris, where a lot of uh, French Jews, for example, are questioning whether they can continue to live uh, or want to live in Europe. And this is obviously something that besides the direct deaths that are caused by terrorism, that I think is the long-term strategic threat uh, to our societies. And that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. We have uh, a few moments for questions for Professor Newman. <coughs> questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Please speak up so that everyone can hear you. Thanks, thanks for the lecture. It was um, <coughs> brilliant. Um, two things are. Um, um, okay. Yes. It doesn't. Okay. Um, yeah. You didn't mention in the numbers of foreign fighters, which I find also crucial in these days, the foreign fighters which are going to Africa. Um, which oh, fight? Only about Syria, yeah, yeah, okay. So, but I think that it's also an interesting thing for the European case, and um, that Dutch Norwegian uh, was just found um, to conduct the attack in Westgate, 2013. The thing is that you talked a lot about how we deal with them or what are the um, threats that are posed, but the thing is how the European authorities are planning to try and prevent their radicalization which is actually the basis, or the lack of integration, or the fact that we have networks since the 50s of, um, you know, there is a debate about radical Islam or radical political Islam, but networks of the Muslim Brotherhood, which operates um, in Germany, UK, and France. And from that, the radicalization is going on by Facebook and other social medias, and then they attack. Mm -hmm. And isn't that also a certain point European authorities' fault that they are not trying to de radicalize and to integrate a society, especially when the today's immigration by the asylum seekers, but also by other people, are entering to Europe. No, I uh, I agree. <laughs> That's 
that's all I can say about that. I mean, it's, I, I would go uh, further than European authorities. I would go, I would even say European societies uh, fault as a well. whole. Good. Another question, yes, sir, with the microphone. Um, Melvin Bold from England. Um, is, is it the case that in nearly every European country, the fighters tend to be the second generation, the first, the, the parents have come, whether it's to the UK, to France, to uh, wherever, and they've been very happy to be there, and then it's the next generation that are born with the resentment? Yes, and uh, second or third generation by now, and um, that's, the, that's the classical phenomenon where people unlike the first generation, no longer feel like they are rooted um, in a particular culture or society. If you look at Britain, for example, second, third generation descendants of Pakistani immigrants do not feel that they are Pakistani necessarily anymore. At least a lot of the customs <coughs> that their parents brought over don't make sense anymore to them in the British context. They were born in Britain, they have British passports, they speak English, yet they don't feel British. And often British society signals to them that they don't consider them to be fully British. So they are neither here nor there, which then creates in some cases a sort of crisis of identity where those recruiters come in and say, look, we have something even better to offer to you. However, it has to be said in this particular mobilization for Syria that we're also seeing a significant number of converts, for example, people who are not uh, who did not grow up as Muslims, especially, for example, in Germany and in Holland, we see a lot of converts, I would estimate, maybe between 15 and 20 percent. If anything, this mobilization has been greater in diversity than any other mobilization I've ever seen before. So if you had talked to me 10 years ago, I would have found it very unusual if someone had told me there's a 17-year-old who decided to go to Pakistan. Now we regularly see 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, even 13-year-olds. Um, in Belgium, the security service told me that the range, age range of their foreign fighters goes from 13 to 69. So there's apparently a 69-year-old Belgium somewhere in Syria. <laughs> I don't know exactly what contribution he makes, but uh, I'm sure he's fit. Um, but there are, of course, also women going, entire families. And that is something that, quite simply, you didn't see five or ten years ago in the case of Pakistan, tribal areas of Pakistan, or even Somalia. That's something that's novel. Good. Let's take one more. Mr. Bradford. <clears throat> Hi, Peter. Thank you. Um, so uh, at start, we have a data set on individual level radicalization in, only in the United States. And we code um, also for variables associated with the foreign fighter phenomenon. So everywhere from the person thought about it but never got on a plane to got caught getting on a plane to made it overseas to, to came back. And we looked at all these different subsets. And um, we found something very similar to one of your last comments, which is that it was the group of people who thought about going but never tried who were, were the most dangerous in terms of their activity in domestic plots, 60% of that subset. And I was wondering if you've tried to quantify or code uh, of the lone actors in Europe that you've been looking at online, those who sort of thought about it or flirted with it but then decided not to and their, their level of arrest. No, because we actually really only look at people who really become fighters. Uh, I mean, that's typically how we find them. You know, um, of course, we come across a lot of wannabe fighters, or as we call them, fanboys, who are on the internet and who are um, sort of talking about it. Um, but systematically, in terms of systematically capturing the content and trying to talk to them, we're really kind of we're really looking only at fighters. But I take your point; it makes a lot of sense, and that also allows me to make one more point, which is that one of the difficulties with numbers is that every country counts numbers differently. And so, for example, when, when you're going about this, you have to be very careful. So, for example, now we hear numbers about the US, for example, of 250. However, those 250 are not people who have actually gone to Sarah. Those are travel attempts. 
you know? And a travel attempt is something very different from someone actually going and making, in, making it into Syria. Travel attempt could be someone who expressed a desire to go there and who was then stopped, who actually never made it out of his house. And some countries count all travel attempts. Other countries count only people who've actually gone. And it's very, very important that as you study this phenomenon, as you're perhaps doing your own research, that you understand very well what the number that you see stands for. And of course, these numbers also always represent all groups, not only Islamic State. And whilst it is true that probably by now most of the Europeans who are going to Syria and Iraq are joining the Islamic State, certainly at the beginning of the conflict, 2012-2013, I mean, the Islamic State didn't even exist in 2012, but even in 2013, it was not necessarily true that even a majority were joining the Islamic State. That became the big thing since last year, but even before you had people joining a plurality of groups, including the Free Syrian Army, including more moderate groups, and typically those are the people who are now back and who are disillusioned because they went there for entirely different reasons than the people who are going now. Thanks again to Peter, Peter Newman, thanks very much. Now, David, the floor is yours. We'll hear what the United Nations has been doing. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you very much, Daphna and Bill, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here back home, if I can say. Um, I, I was asked to speak about the daunting task of the what the response is to this threat. And um, what I was thinking of doing is um, trying to uh, take stock of what has happened in, um, in particular in the UN Security Council um, since um, the, in, in the last, I would say, 15 months. The turning point, as uh, Peter already mentioned, was June 2014, um, where uh, the Islamic uh, State invaded large parts of Iraq, and it will be uh, quite fair to say that that um, created um, alarms all over um, um, the UN, and this was also the point, something like a few weeks uh, later, where um, the, 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 the thinking, the, the initial thinking about what needs to be done um, started um, coming up more and more in conversations and in um, discussions. What I will try to do is to speak a little bit about the past of uh, Resolution 2178. I assume, I take for granted that anyone who is here knows the resolution or at least saw it once or read it. So I won't speak very much about the resolution itself, just highlight a few points. So on the, a little bit about what led to the resolution, the resolution itself, and then um, take stock of what happened since the resolution up till today. So as I said at the beginning, around June, July, um, there were initial talks, um, non-formal, um, about a response. Around July, um, the U.S. came up uh, with the very first draft, um, and that led to very intensive uh, negotiations over a period of two months um, over uh, what became probably the most uh, important um, Security Council resolution um, since 9-11. Uh, um, there is not much difference between the first draft and the last draft. That's very interesting to say. Um, because the most important element in the draft was the first time um, that the UN was able, uh, not just the UN, um, to come up with a definition of what this new phenomena legally, what legally this phenomena is. Um, and the resolution provides for the first time a definition of um, a foreign terrorist fighter. I mean, 
Peter spoke about the phenomena, but it's one thing to speak about the phenomena, but it's a completely different thing to define it legally. Um, so this was one area that a consensus uh, was needed to be reached, and it wasn't uh, so difficult because we had a context uh, for this, and the context was uh, the need to distinct this uh, new phenomena from other known phenomena in international law um, related to uh, people going from one conflict to another, and the most relevant was the, um, the mercenaries uh, uh, convention. And the idea was to take the concept of mercenaries, which is legally defined in a, in a UN convention, and to distinct, it, distinct the new phenomena from the old one. And indeed, this is how the uh, resolution was structured. And the, and, and the difference is very clear. A mercenary is someone who goes for, to a conflict, to join a conflict for the purpose of gaining something, uh, money usually. And um, a foreign terrorist fighter is someone who joins a conflict uh, for ideological reasons, um, in, um, in order to commit terrorist acts, and that allowed uh, the, the, the negotiating members to, um, to define it and from that um, to move on. There was also a lot of work done during that, uh, during the year before, um, uh, before the resolution was adopted by the GCTF, the Global Center for um, um, Counter Terror, no, the Global Center, GC, Forum. Counter Terrorism Forum. I'm sorry, there's so many. Um, but the GCTF is, is a crucial one. I'm seeing Liat here from the Global Center, and I'm always confusing with the Global Center and the Global Forum, but she's not even more at the Global Center. Um, uh, the GCTF has done some remarkable work on putting together ideas, good practices uh, in the area of uh, foreign terrorist fighters, and that allowed to take up many of these elements and bring them into the uh, resolution. Um, so this was July, uh, it started in July, but July, um, and then August and September. And actually, while you were talking, uh, Peter, I looked at our, my calendar and I saw that your briefing was exactly one year ago, today. We're celebrating it in New York. Um, unfortunately, I cannot uh, participate in the um, in, in, in the celebration. Uh, but um, it was exactly uh, in September that everything uh, was um, sped up, and the 15 members of the, the, the resolution, the concept, was presented. And just for, for, for those of you who are not familiar, usually Security Council resolutions, um, Security Council in general, it's not a democratic. Uh, entity as such. We, we know that five members have veto power, and usually negotiations start at the level of uh, P5, sometimes even P3, sometimes even P1, when one member negotiates with itself and then pushes it uh, as much as they can, as much as it can. But the key negotiations happen at the P5 level, at the permanent five members, and then move out to the, uh, to the 15 members, and indeed around this time it was moved from the five, where they agreed more or less on uh, the language, to the 15, and um, with uh, the presentation um, that um, Peter uh, was, um, was mentioning. And then there were another round of negotiations that led to the adoption of the resolution. Um, we're now about to uh, celebrate one year of the resolution. What the resolution does, just for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with it, it defines for the first time uh, in international law what foreign terrorist fighters are, and then from that moves on to requiring member states to take certain actions against this phenomena. Um, again, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, when the, when the Security Council adopts resolution under 
Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. This is the charter, this is the part of the charter that uh, provides the Security Council uh, with uh, authority to take action to uh, protect or preserve international peace and security. Its resolutions are binding upon all member states, whether they were part of negotiations or not, whether they just received uh, a copy of it uh, a day before or a day after its adoption, they're binding, because this is part of the UN Charter. These are actions taken in order to protect a peace and security, and therefore all members are required to implement it. Um, what are the actions? In, uh, again, in general, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the resolution, it requires all member states to criminalize, criminalize the travel, but not just the travel. Any assistance or support to, their tra to this travel, including organization or facilitation or financing of travel, has to be criminalized by all member states. It also requires member states to protect and enhance their border, protect their borders and international and the international co uh, cooperation in, in preventing the travel of uh, foreign terrorist fighters. And uh, for the first time in, uh, in a Chapter 7 uh, resolution, incorporate CVE elements into a Security Council resolution, meaning the part, inherent part of the resolution, all the requirements that I believe we, we, we talked here in this conference several times about what CV entails, but the important thing from our perspective is that it's part of a binding Chapter 7 Security Council resolution that member states need not just to prevent, to uh, uh, repress, to, uh, um, to, um, to criminalize, actions relating to foreign terrorist fighter, but they need also to look how to prevent, uh, uh, how to deal with what motivates people to uh, join uh, the Islamic State um, cause. So this is the resolution. Resolution was adopted, as, uh, uh, as um, you, you, you may recall, in a Security Council summit presided by uh, President Obama with the participation at the level of heads of state. It happens very, very rarely that Security Council resolutions, even the binding one, are adopted at such level. It was co-sponsored by more than 100 uh, member states, and that is an important element, because as I said, Security Council as such is not a democratic body as we know. I mean, yes, eventually they vote for or against the resolution, but it is more or less decided in the structure I mentioned of the P5 agreeing, then moving to the 15, and even the 15 themselves decide for 193 uh, member states. So the fact that the resolution was co-sponsored by, if I recall well, 104 member states provides another layer of legitimacy um, to the resolution. And in this resolution, um, it is particularly important uh, this uh, added uh, legitimacy. And the reason is that uh, there are, unlike most Security Council resolutions, what this resolution does, and this, this moves me to uh, what we're doing from the adoption of the resolution actually up till uh, today, and what will probably keep us uh, busy in, in, in the next few uh, months at least, is that this resolution, in this resolution, the Security Council used what is what could be referred, and I'm sure that Daphna will speak about it, its legislative quote-unquote powers. Um, originally, the, 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 the role of the Security Council is perceived as taking actions to, uh, uh, to uh, pr preserve or protect international peace and security. What such actions would normally entail it could be uh, political measures, it could be sanctions, it could be, in rare occasions, use of force. Um, but it's very rare that the Security Council said we are um, in, in, in a Chapter 7 situation, we need to do something urgently to preserve, to protect peace and security, and what we're doing is basically a legal response. Normally, usually, when countries 
are uh, want to develop their uh, uh, the, the international law, they develop a convention. They agree among themselves that up till now we agreed that this phenomena is legitimate. From now on, we want to prevent trafficking in, in organs. We want to do something that did not exist. Member states sit together normally for years, go on every word, and then decide. And sovereignly, they also accept it by, by, by signing and ratifying the convention. Security Council resolutions don't work like that, yet they have the same legal status, uh, that, that of being binding. And that creates a whole range of new challenges that basically keep us busy from, um, from the day the resolution uh, was adopted up till now. And what we are, have done since then is basically, um, I would say, three things. And this is what we are moving from the day of uh, the resolution till today. And I would start with the first one, which is assessing the situation, assessing Okay, this is the new resolution. Um, where, can, where member states uh, stand vis-a-vis -vis the resolution? And um, we started a very intensive exercise of mapping, assessing where member states stand, what are the key challenges and gaps. We were very fortunate to benefit from the support of uh, Syracuse University, who, uh, actually, I think we met day of two after the adoption of the resolution, and um, uh, Bill kindly suggested, listen, everything uh, we can do to support you, we will do. And I immediately asked him how many students you have in the center, and he said, I could afford 15. I said, 15 is great. And all the 15 actually uh, worked with us quite closely on trying to assess the, the legal and criminal uh, justice um, um, challenges that member states, or, or the response that um, member states uh, have taken, and provided, if I may say, a wonderful report that we will uh, we, we certainly uh, rely on um, and, and, and benefit from. Uh, but this, of course, came up with uh, other exercises that uh, uh, we were doing first, we have our own uh, assessment tools, and we visit many countries. And uh, through that, we were able to, to provide to the Security Council several, up till now, uh, I think four, and soon there will be a fifth report coming out of where, where member states face. We provided thematic reports, for example, one on challenges in, in, in the prosecution of terrorism, another thematic report on a specific requirements in the resolution that requires countries to uh, look into, uh, um, uh, to, to provide to each other advanced passenger information, and we provided another, uh, re we will provide soon another report on issues relating to CVE and incitement, and three regional reports. So the first thing, uh, that we uh, started doing was assessing. Um, we also worked with uh, in international partners on enhancing and promoting the implementation uh, of the resolution. In Europe, uh, we work very closely uh, with Eurojust and with the other organization, the Council of Europe. Um, we met actually on, on the day of the adoption of the resolution with the Secretary General of the Council of Europe and encouraged him to take immediate steps to provide for European implementation of the resolution, which the Council of Europe uh, did, and in quite a, a, an, a, an un almost unprecedented uh, pace was able to conclude its own uh, convention or additional protocol um, that will implement um, the resolution. Um, second area that we uh, um, um, that we uh, started doing is to provide advice for many member states. The resolution, like all Security Council resolution, um, is are 
drafted in very, um, I would say, at, at 30,000 feet level uh, of description um, uh, of what needs to be done. And um, for member states to implement them, um, many, many questions may come up. And we started immediately after the resolution was, was adopted to receive requests for advice, for guidance, and by the way, not from the least developed countries of the world. We received requests for, I cannot mention countries, of course, but we received requests for advice and guidance from some of the most developed countries of the world that wanted to implement the resolution, but said, listen, we don't really understand what this means, what this entails, and we started and continued to work with member states on how to implement um, this uh, resolution effectively. Um, um, I have two minutes. And um, the third thing uh, we, are, um, we, we started doing is to try to uh, look on uh, which areas of the resolution there actually aren't enough um, effective responses. So, for example, uh, the resolution speaks uh, about uh, the need for all member states to develop a prosecution, rehabilitation, and reintegration strategies for returnees. This is the language of the resolution. This is how Security Council resolution works. Uh, they provide one sentence, and then member states need to figure out, okay, we want to implement it, but could you tell us what are effective prosecution strategies for returnees? The issue is that nobody has the response so far. I mean, member states are trying, trying their best, but um, not all of them have uh, effective response, and so far we cannot say, listen, if you go with this model, it will work for you. So that created, from our perspective, a call um, to the research community, and I could reiterate this call, and perhaps with that I, uh, I can conclude, um, to work with us uh, and with member states on those areas of the resolution where there aren't enough responses. Yes, when it comes to criminalize FTFs, we could say very clearly what needs to be done. But when it comes to prosecution or rehabilitation strategies, we cannot say that we have the right answer as of yet. Um, but we want to be able to do so. And the research community um, can do uh, and is doing a lot of research to tell what works, what doesn't work. And the same applies to many, many other elements of the resolution. Um, how to effectively implement API system, how to uh, effectively implement uh, eff um, CVE strategies, how to uh, work uh, on risk assessment of returnees, how to work with women or youth who are traveling. All these issues, um, Security Council require, uh, resolution requires member states to implement. We at this stage cannot say that we could offer guidance or um, advice to member states in a way that um, um, that actually uh, will provide them with, the, with with effective implementation of the resolution. And again, as I and I will conc uh, conclude that it is a call from us. And uh, uh, our executive director reiterated that in his speech two days ago to more cooperate with the research community so that we will be able to. Uh, get back to uh, member states and say this actually works and it's research uh, proven. Thank you. We have time for a few questions for Mr. Sharia. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you, good morning, and thanks for the presentation. As always, interesting stuff. My question relates to the linkages between this resolution 2178 and previous resolution 1624 on CVE and 1373, 
What kind of work is being done within CTED to assure that there's linkages as member states or sometimes maybe they view the work that needs to come with each resolution as a burden on them. You know, each resolution has a new set of activities. So, so what kind of work is being done to streamline the activities that a member state needs to, to produce in order to be compliant with all those three, for example, rather than each one separately? I think that's a challenge we keep hearing from states. Um, it's a good idea. Um, frankly, no work is done. Um, and I'm hesitant to take any other work for us um, because we, th the challenge as it is right now is, is, is at least w with our limited capabilities or, and capacity, um, the truth is that we're focusing on 2178. We're not on a, a reach the level where c we could integrate other previous Security Council resolution into one comprehensive uh, tool. What we're trying to do right now is to develop, uh, and this uh, was a work that we um, that kept us busy throughout most of the summer, to provide guiding uh, materials on Resolution 2178. Uh, we developed what is referred to as guiding principles for their implementation of the resolution which now is being negotiated uh, by, uh, the, the uh, by the Security Council members, and hopefully within a few weeks it will be out and approved. Um, there are legal issues relating to incorporation of all the three into one corpus or to one um, um, coherent um, product, but I agree with you completely that this is something that member states will be uh, very thankful, uh, specifically those who are struggling to understand all the different resolutions that uh, the Security Council has bombarded them with. Specifically in the last year, we had three major landmark resolutions on, on foreign terrorist fighters, uh, and that will be of extreme uh, value to member states. Another question? I'll take a moment just to add a little context to David's remarks, and he uh, he invoked the the support that some students at Syracuse University provided to CTED. One of the most remarkable things about the work that CTE does is that he mentioned 193 member states. The law staff is in your shop around 10. Sorry, you have about 10 lawyers. Um, 12. 12 lawyers, uh, and the terms of 2178 needed to be implemented in 193 member states. So the task of providing advice, con consultation, uh, review of domestic law provisions is quite daunting indeed for, for dozens of lawyers, much less uh, a shop of 12. Uh, so when I happened to be minding my own business in New York City one day last September and stopped in for a coffee with David and he uh, had the good uh, judgment to ask whether we might have some students at Syracuse who could provide a little bit of assistance toward what was about to become 2178, I think was actually a few days before the Obama trip to New York that we met. Uh, we, we did. Uh, put together a group actually of 17 students who worked very hard for a full semester and provided a report uh, 175 pages, this one in my hand, uh, that covered about 50 uh, countries in a, in a preliminary way only. This work is, uh, could, could be redone three or four times as a professor. I'm never satisfied with the first draft and this needs a lot of attention, but it's pretty solid and helpful to the group. As David mentioned, this resolution is, is different than many other international law instruments in that it was created inside the small group, the P5 and then the 15. So unlike treaties, which might address terrorism in a variety of measures, a number of treaties, of course, have before and after 9-11, unlike the treaties who might percolate up in a more organic fashion, allowing some domestic states to have adopted measures that would be supporting uh, the terms of the treaty, this in a way was uh, sprung on member states from above. So the implementation phase is not only critical, but for many states it's new. 
it imposes on them a set of considerations, not only in criminalizing the offenses that David talked about in his remarks, but in thinking about so-called soft power or alternative ways of dealing with the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters short of law enforcement. And then finally, as he asked us last fall to begin looking, what administrative measures might states take short of criminal law enforcement to deal with borders, to deal with uh, travel uh, permissions, no-fly lists, watch lists, mechanisms inside the state to keep track of those who might be amenable to these kind of influences. Peter, do you want to comment? Yeah, can I uh, just add uh, a couple of things sure. which I think are important. Uh, the first thing is something that you just mentioned, Bill. Just to illustrate this, in Germany, for example, the federal prosecutor in relation to foreign fighters has, over the past two years, brought 500 indictments. Yep. There are 500 indictments pending. That has never before been the case. You know, the Bader Meinhof group only had 20 members in total, right? right? Uh, so, so you have an unprecedented number of prosecutions that may or may not happen in years to come. And that's why it is so important that this resolution actually, in addition to prosecution, also talks about prevention and about dealing with returned foreign fighters in ways that are not necessarily all about prosecution because for a lot of European countries, for example, it is just not feasible to bring full prosecutions against everyone because of the number of cases. In Germany, even in Germany, that will not be possible. But now imagine smaller countries like Belgium, like Denmark, the numbers they are confronted with and the, the very small capacity that they have. That's one important point. And the second important point is just to reiterate something that uh, David has said and that you have said, but that perhaps those of you who are not lawyers like myself didn't fully realize what this, what this resolution does, and you know, I, I'm quite, I used to be quite a UN skeptic before. Oh. And <laughs> sorry to say that, David. I used, no, but I mean, this resolution, um, wherever, wherever I have gone in, in Europe and spoken to government people over the past 12 months, they have told me, we are currently doing stuff to implement resolution 217A. The, the idea that you know, a resolution in the UN Security Council, which at the end of the day is just a piece of paper, actually triggers action in every single country in the world, in countries where basically there were no laws up until last year to no. prevent foreign fighters. There are now laws and people are being prosecuted. It actually demonstrates that the organization that David works for actually does, in certain respects, have a lot of power and can make uh, sovereign states do stuff. So I found that very, very impressive. Very good. David, how many times will you hear a comment like Peter's here? Yeah. Uh, is, <laughs> for, for me, the most impressive thing that when he cited credible resources, he cited the UN. I was then, <laughs> I, I cannot ask for more, but to hear even that. Uh, um, yeah, I agree with 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 the, with, with the comments of uh, of the two uh, of the two of you, and I'm sure we will hear more from uh, from others. It's. It's like a bomb put put in the center of the of the UN Security Council hall, and then its effect uh, uh, is 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 really tremendous. And the level of mobilization that I've seen, uh, and I'm quite some time with the UN, but the level of mobilization that 2178 created um, is unprecedented. Again, from the time of 9/11 uh, and the adoption of uh, 13. Uh, 73. It's of course the resolution, but no less so, and probably more so, the fact that member states are deeply concerned, uh, deeply feel threatened by uh, this uh, new phenomena, and and really want to do uh, something. Um, so yes, it, it, it's good that member states want to do something, and but the challenge from us, as I said, and this is a daily challenge from uh, uh, for us, and as we speak and sit here. I, I constantly get a request for more and more products and uh, information on what exactly do we do with it. Because the, the number of questions that this, quest that this resolution 
in this, and we haven't touched, we mentioned the issue of prosecution strategies that you mentioned, which is a huge issue, rehabilitation, reintegration. There are also some very complex criminal justice and legal questions and international law questions and relations between IHL uh, and human rights law that this resolution, and it's gonna, gonna keep us busy, I think, for the next few years. Um, I think before we go to the second half of the program, we'll take a short 10 minutes break now. Thank you.
חברה בקהילה של הישראלים שעובדים בטרור ברור. אבל עכשיו היא באיזה שהיא לוחמה. קודם כל לוחמים, קודם כל לומדים להילחם, אבל אנחנו בצד הלא מדהים. אז אני חזרה בנושא שישית, ואני חושב שהם נכנסים שם בעיקר, אני לא יודע אם אתם יודעים את זה, אבל אני לא יודע אם
it needs some work. It's pretty decent too. Well, I think credit card is You can totally say you know what is so I believe we're about ready to reconvene, please. And we're going to start in the middle. Professor Nathan Sales from Syracuse on uh, what the United States does. So thanks, Bill. Um, thanks to the ICT and to Daphna in particular for hosting us here. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back in Israel, uh, weather notwithstanding. Um, so unprecedented dust cloud descends on us from Syria and Iraq. Um, I'm sure there's a metaphor there. So I'm sorry? I said the shifting sands. The shifting sands, quite literally. <laughs> quite literally. Right? Um, so I'd like to focus on two problems. Uh, the, the first problem is how do you prevent American citizens from traveling abroad uh, to serve as foreign fighters for ISIS or other terrorist organizations? And then the second aspect um, is preventing foreign citizens from traveling to the United States uh, to commit attacks there. Um, I'm going to give an overview of U.S. law uh, and how the United States seeks to address both of those problems, as well as some of the underlying policy and operational considerations. Um, and I will do so along two dimensions. So, so first, what are the criminal laws in place that can be used to uh, address these problems? And also, um, what are some of the regulatory measures, uh, administrative or surveillance related measures, um, that we can use to address these problems? So starting off with uh, the criminal law, the, the, the principal legal instrument in the United States is the so-called material support statute. Now, th this is a statute that has been on the books uh, for, for much longer longer than uh, the relevant UN resolutions. This actually dates back to 1994. Um, it was enacted shortly after the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. The, the goal of the material support statute is to criminalize preparatory acts that eventually culminate in terrorist activity. Right, so imagine the life cycle of a terrorist operation uh, from conception to execution. There are a lot of different things that have to happen along the way, such as raising money, uh, such as traveling to receive training, traveling to case the target, dry runs, tests, and so on. Uh, and the idea of the material support statute is to push back in that life cycle the moment at which criminal liability attaches. Right? So no longer wait for a completed attack or formation of a conspiracy to commit an attack, but, but look back farther in time um, and identify discrete moments at which we can impose criminal liability uh, for a chain of events that will eventually culminate in terrorism. Um, the statute scope, it might fairly be described uh, as sweeping. Um, let me read you what the term material support uh, is defined as. The, the term material support or resources means any property, tangible or intangible, or service, including currency or monetary instruments or financial securities, financial services, lodging, training, expert advice or assistance, I'm only halfway done, safe houses, false documentation or identification, communications equipment, facilities, weapons, lethal substances, explosives, personnel, parentheses, one or more individuals who may be or include oneself, end parentheses, and transportation, except medicine or religious materials. Now, why did I subject you to that excruciatingly long statutory definition? Not just to show you that congressional interns aren't so good with the English language, um, but, but to illustrate the sweeping scope uh, of, of this language. So, so what sorts of things are prohibited by the material support statute. Well, let's say uh, you want to raise money for ISIS. Is that illegal? Well, yes, it is under the material support statute. Collecting money uh, uh, to provide to a terrorist organization certainly counts as currency or monetary instruments or financial securities or financial services. Um, any one of those uh, might conceivably be implicated. Suppose you want to recruit for ISIS. Talk to your buddies, try and persuade them to travel to Syria to fight on behalf of the organization. Um, that also uh, is probably a violation of the material support statute. It's a crime to provide personnel. Your buddies are personnel. What if you're a facilitator? Um, you help book travel arrangements, uh, connect 
uh, foreign fighters, uh, with contacts in uh, Turkey who can uh, bust them across the border into Syria. That also probably violates the statute as well. That might be considered a provision of personnel. Uh, it might be a provision of lodging because they have to stay someplace en route. Um, it might be communications equipment because you might be putting them in touch with uh, 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 persons overseas with untraceable cell phones or using special SIM cards uh, to make these communications and so on. What if you want to join ISIS? Well, that also is probably a violation of the statute. Statute. Um, that is the provision of personnel. And if that weren't clear enough on the face of the statute, the term personnel, uh, the statute has that additional helpful parenthetical that says the term personnel also includes you. Right? So if you provide yourself to a designated terrorist organization, um, that counts as an illegal criminal provision of material, supports, uh, m material support. Um, one other crucial feature of the statute beyond its sweeping breadth is its extraterritorial application. Um, unlike a number of uh, other countries' laws uh, that are coming on the books now and that have been on the books for a while, uh, this statute expressly states that it applies overseas. Right? So you, you don't escape the long reach of uh, federal law by fleeing to Syria to commit terrorist atrocities there. Uh, we can get you there. Um, at least if you're an American citizen. Um, the statute, because of its breadth, indeed precisely because of its breadth, uh, breadth uh, raises a number of potential constitutional difficulties. Uh, in the United States, we have a constitutional doctrine known as void for vagueness. Um, the basic idea is that if a if a statute, and in particular a criminal prohibition, fails to provide citizens with fair notice of what conduct is prohibited and what is expected of them, um, it's an unconstitutional violation of due process. And indeed, over the two-decade lifespan of the material support statute, we've seen a number of cases challenging uh, ambiguities in some of the words and phrases. So what does expert advice and assistance mean? Uh, what does personnel mean? Over the years, um, in response to these to Decisions, Congress has enacted a series of uh, modifications and amendments designed to provide more specificity about what the term material support includes and what's excluded. Right? Um, so who knows what future litiga litigation will hold, um, but, but it seems like the initial round of litigation has ironed out a number of the ambiguities uh, and we now have a, a fairly durable statute in place. So that's the criminal law. Um, what about regulatory, administrative, or preventive measures? Basically, the box, uh, uh, the other box into which we can pour a number of other uh, mechanisms. Um, I'd like to go through a, a couple of different proposals and uh, existing laws and uh, measures, um, highlight some of the potential upsides of these uh, proposals and measures and some of the downsides as well. So, so one, and we might call this the, the nuclear uh, approach, is to revoke citizenship. Right? If you go to Syria to fight with ISIS, um, you're no longer an American citizen. Um, other countries have considered, and I think maybe even adopted, I'll have to look at that 170 pages a bit more closely, uh, other countries have considered or perhaps even adopted similar measures. Um, it seems, uh, frankly, sort of far-fetched, but um, it's actually being pushed by uh, a number of prominent members of the House of Representatives including uh, and senators, including one uh, presidential candidate. Uh, so the existing law in the United States provides that uh, if you serve in the armed forces of a state um, that is engaged in hostilities against the United States, that is a basis for revocation of citizenship. Right? And so proponents of a comparable measure for ISIS say, well, we're simply updating the law to reflect the current forms of hostilities. Right? So uh, going to join a hostile terrorist organization is comparable to going to join a hostile army. You know, fighting for al-Qaeda is similar to fighting for the Nazis in World War II. Um, so we're simply updating the law to reflect uh, the, the changed circumstances that, uh, surrounding the nature of conflict today. Today and you know the argument has uh, at least some appeal to it. Um, there does seem to be some sort of symmetry between those two types of defection, as it were. Um, 
But in this context, there's the statelessness problem that we don't really see uh, in traditional armed conflict. So if you go to fight with the Nazis, um, you can transfer your allegiance from one state to the other. Um, you're not left stateless. By contrast, if you go to fight for Al-Qaeda, you go to fight for the Islamic State, notwithstanding ISIS's pretensions of being a governing state, nobody recognizes them as such. You're not really transferring your citizenship from one to another. You're, you would effectively be giving it up, right? And that's problematic, right? Um, there's also the, the issue of operational necessity. Do you, do you really need to revoke somebody's citizenship uh, to manage the terrorist threat that they pose? Probably not. Right? If you know enough about them uh, to revoke their citizenship, you can probably prevent them from entering the country. You can probably prevent them from getting on airplanes um, and so on. You don't need to use nuclear weapons if conventional weapons will do just as well. Um, so that's how you might, so that's the, uh, a, a, a pretty robust and aggressive proposal. Uh, a slightly less uh, aggressive proposal is to simply revoke American citizens' passports. If they don't have travel documents, they can't go abroad uh, to Turkey and then cross the border into Syria. Uh, what's the law provide on that? Well, the State Department regulations allow the Secretary of State uh, to revoke a U.S. citizen's passport um, if there's, quote, serious damage to the national security. Right. So not just damage, but, but serious damage to the national security. Um, one question uh, with this authority is what sort of process uh, is made available to U.S. citizens um, whose passports might be revoked? Um, we see a similar problem in the context of the no-fly list, for example. Um, if there is derogatory information uh, available to the government indicating that you might be a threat. Um, you go on a variety of lists, the no-fly list, the selectee list, a couple others, I won't bore you with the details. Um, there has been uh, some litigation in the US challenging on due process grounds the procedures, the redress procedures made available to those who find their names on the list. Um, the, the, the touchstone of American due process uh, jurisprudence is you must be given notice and an opportunity to rebut the allegations against you. Um, and it's not at all clear that the current redress procedures for the no-fly list are adequate. Uh, a fortiori, it's not clear that the procedures for revoking uh, a citizen's passport um, um, are sufficiently robust to allow a person to say, no, 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 I'm not actually a member of ISIS. That's the other Joe Smith, not Joe Smith born in 1972, right? Um, wh why does redress matter? Well, redress matters, I think, because there's a potential overbreadth problem here. So if you revoke somebody's passport, you prevent them from traveling abroad for nefarious purposes. But you might also uh, prevent them from traveling abroad for entirely innocent purposes. Maybe they have to go to Paris to attend a family funeral. Uh, maybe they want to attend a pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, you're interfering with some potentially uh, important uh, and innocent and travel as well. What if you're already abroad when the United States decides to revoke your passport? Well, one possibility, of course, is that you might be stranded, um, and perhaps that's the intended outcome. Um, but there's a pretty easy workaround that, that might enable you to continue to travel internationally, notwithstanding uh, the revocation of your US passport. Um, we might call it the Snowden workaround. You might find a sympathetic state that's willing to issue you, uh, grant you asylum, and issue you temporary travel documents. Uh, now, it's unlikely to say the least uh, that there is a state sufficiently sympathetic to ISIS uh, that it would be willing to make that move. But it's not hard to imagine other terrorist organizations uh, that might do something, uh, terrorist organizations with strong state sponsorship, something like Hezbollah, for instance. You can very easily imagine Iran issuing travel documents uh, to uh, U.S. citizens who, uh, whose passport was revoked. So those two administrative measures concern preventing Americans from traveling abroad to join uh, ISIS or other terrorist organizations. Uh, what about the other strategic goal here, which is preventing inbound travelers uh, from doing harm to the United States? Well, one thing you can do is revoke a non-citizen's visa. Um, if you don't have a visa, you can't come to the US. And if you can't come to the US, you can't get on a plane to the US, which means you can't blow it up en route. Um, again, the State Department regulations here provide that uh, the Secretary of State can revoke at any time Right, can revoke a visa at any time in hers or her discretion. Right? Fairly sweeping grant of authority. Um, so are these sorts of consular decisions subject to review? Probably not. 
Right? So in the United States, we have a doctrine uh, known as consular non-reviewability. And the idea is that if a consular official abroad uh, decides that you're not entitled to a visa, you have no recourse to American courts whatsoever. And the underlying idea is uh, if you are a non-citizen located outside the United States, you have essentially no rights under our Constitution. You're not present, you're not a citizen, you have no ties to the country, um, and therefore the courts will not be made available to you uh, to hear your complaints. What happens if you're already in the United States when your visa is revoked, a student visa, work visa, or what have you? Um, here it's a bit more difficult. You're, you're probably, in fact, almost certainly entitled to some sort of process, although it's not clear and courts have not yet made uh, uh, apparent what that process would be. See, for instance, the Guantanamo Bay cases. Right? Um, uh, if you are in uh, custody at Guantanamo Bay, that is, sufficient, that is a sufficient tie to the United States to entitle Entitle you uh, to bring a petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Uh, it's sufficient, connect, sufficient connection to the United States uh, for you to have some sort of rights under the Due Process Clause. And you might see a similar challenge uh, to the revocation of a visa by a person held, uh, here in the United States. I have five minutes, so I'll wrap up quickly. Um, how effective is this? remedy of revoking visas. Um, it can be, but it ultimately depends on the quality of the underlying information. You have to collect information to know that somebody is a threat, and then you have to share it widely throughout the government to ensure that all decision makers have access to it. That doesn't always happen. So for instance, uh, the Christmas Day bomber, uh, Abdul Matalab from 2009, um, he was actually on the intelligence community's radar screen because his father, of all people, um, had uh, reached out to US officials expressing concern that his son was taking a path towards radicalization. Uh, the information, I think, was it the State Department? Oh, no. It, well, certain people had it and certain people didn't. And the people who didn't have it were the people who were in charge of revoking visas. Um, so although the right hand had the, the report, the left hand, which was the hand that actually needed to make an operational decision, didn't have it. Right? So um, um, in theory, a useful strategy, uh, but in practice, not always effective. What do we do with Western Europeans, however? Uh, if you are a Brit, if you're a, a citizen of France, if you're, from, if you're one of the 400 Belgians, you don't need a visa to come to the United States. You can simply book a ticket and hop on a plane. This is due to a 1980s era program known as the Visa Waiver Program. Um, you can travel without any advance permission uh, from US uh, consular or border security officials. Needless to say, there is a significant terrorist threat emanating from Western Europe. Uh, shoe bomber Richard Reed was perhaps the first example of that. Uh, the Heathrow plot from the mid-2000s uh, is another uh, very vivid illustration of the threat uh, that the United States and European countries face uh, from radicalized populations, um, of which the foreign fighter uh, 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 problem today is only the most recent incarnation. Um, so how do you solve this problem? How do you prevent radicalized uh, terrorist threats from coming to the United States where you don't know they're coming because there's no visa requirement? Well, you look for other sources of information. Under US law, uh, airlines flying to and from the United States are required to turn over passenger information. Um, David mentioned uh, advanced passenger information, or API. It's also known as PNR, passenger name records. Uh, what does this information include? It's fairly anodyne stuff that you give to your airline when you book a ticket. Your name, your frequent flyer number, maybe the method of payment, uh, your seat assignment, um, that sort of information. It's fairly anodyne, but it's a very useful counterterrorism tool. Um, there's a report from the Markle Foundation in the early 2000s, sh shortly after the 9-11 attack, uh, indicating that if counterterrorism authorities had had access to airline reservation data, it would have been possible to identify the connections between all 19 of the 9-11 hijackers. So you start with two of the hijackers who were known to have attended uh, a terrorist summit in Malaysia. Working out in a series of concentric circles, you would look for, for instance, well, has anybody else ever used the same mailing address as these two individuals? And it turns out that five other people had, including Mohammed Atta, the operational ringleader of the plot. You go out another concentric circle by looking for frequent flyer numbers, and you uh, sweep in another group of the hijackers. And eventually, working outward, um, you would have identified the links between all 19 of them. Um, so, 
passenger name records, advanced passenger information is a useful way of identifying people uh, uh, inbound, right? You can do watch listing. So is this person on a list of known or suspected terrorists? More ambitiously, you can also do what's known as link analysis or, or contact chaining. That's what the, uh, the Markle Foundation report is describing. You basically paint a picture of a known terrorist's social networks uh, and try and identify from that uh, unknown threats. Right, um, connecting Secretary Rumsfeld's uh, known unknowns to the unknown unknowns. Right, um, the problem with this system, one of the problems with this system, is that you only see information about the flights that touch your country. The U.S. sees information about flights from Frankfurt to Newark, but it doesn't see information about flights from Frankfurt to Istanbul. Right. Um, so it will be important, I think, going forward for uh, Western nations, indeed all nations, to look for ways to expand the uh, coverage of this sort of system, to expand the sharing of information under a system like that. There are a couple of different versions of what that could look like. Uh, the most modest version would be to simply share watch list information. We know that this person is a foreign terrorist fighter, so hey, Yanks, be on the lookout for Joe Smith, right? Um, visa waiver program countries are already engaged in this sort of information sharing. Um, there's no reason why something similar couldn't be expanded uh, under uh, 2178. A more ambitious version of this cooperative program would be to share the underlying raw data, right? The, the API information that France collects could be shared with Turkey, and the API data that Turkey collects could be shared with the United States. Um, it's much more ambitious uh, in part because of the scope, but perhaps more importantly because of the underlying privacy concerns here. Um, Europe traditionally has looked uh, out of the corner of its eye at the American PNR system, it's not at all clear, given uh, differing privacy conceptions, that European policymakers uh, would, would have much appetite for adopting something similar uh, on the continent. But 2178 may be a game changer. We'll see. Thank you all. We have time for a few questions for Nathan. Right here. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering if CT officials look into every passenger that's flying into the U.S. or only if there is a perceived threat or intel that's come in. Yeah, I think um, it's 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 been a while since I've been uh, on the inside. Um, now now I'm just a commentator. Um, so I don't actually know. I. What I do know is that every passenger gets a minimum level of, of screening. Um, what that involves is typically uh, matching names against watch lists of, of known or suspected terrorists. Um, um, so identity resolution. You know, we, we know that M. Atta is a bad guy. Here we have uh, Matt Atta. Is that the same one? Well, in order to figure that out, we look at additional data fields such as date of birth, such as passport number, um, and, and, and so on. Um, and then, in addition to the sort of the watch list matching, uh, what happens is, uh, you know, you can look for suspicious patterns of activity. Um, if there is a particular travel agency that is known for having uh, booked flights for aspiring jihadis, you know, you would look at people um, who have uh, reservations from the same travel agency. What are the so? If there's a match, what are the consequences? Um, sometimes it's you can't fly. Uh, sometimes it's you get a closer look when you land at, at, at secondary, right? So you don't just get to go through uh, welcome to the United States. You get referred to a, a, a secondary inspection where there's a more detailed set of questions. Um, um, and sometimes you get sent back. That, that actually happened to a Jordanian fellow named Raid Albana um, in, I forget, 2000, early 2000s. Um, he had been to the U.S. a couple of times previously. He had a, a legitimate passport. He had a valid visa. Um, but there was something in the data that didn't look quite right. So when he was referred to secondary, he got a closer look. Um, he seemed evasive, so the customs officials put him on the next flight back home. Um, and a year later, uh, he blew up in a suicide bomb attack in Hilla, Iraq, I think 100 or so police recruits. And at the time, it was the deadliest suicide bombing that Iraq had seen. Uh, we actually know it was Albana because authorities found the hand 
uh, on the steering wheel of the car and it matched his fingerprints. Um, so you know, who knows what he would have done if he came into the United States. We actually don't know for certain that he planned to commit an attack. So you know, it's not to say the same thing would have happened. Um, but it's nice not to have found out. Other question? Yes. Um, I have a question because you said it's problematic to uh, revoke uh, the passport of someone because maybe he or she is innocent or want to attend a funeral. But um, so I want to ask what are the, um, I mean, what has to happen to revoke someone's passport? But I mean, they have to be like a reason. It's not that you just take away someone's passport for no reason. So the person has to be kind of uh, suspicious or involvement in something. Yeah, so, so the legal standard is that the person presents a serious threat to the national security. Um, that doesn't really provide a whole lot of guidance to the Secretary of State, and it doesn't really constrain the Secretary's exercise of discretion, right? And so suppose somebody files suit. Um, the, the, the legal question for the court to decide will be, the, the underlying, the, the merits question, the substantive question for the court to decide will be, did the Secretary of State properly conclude that this person presents a serious threat to the national security? It is very, very difficult to imagine a court, at least in the United States, second guessing a determination like that. So the question then becomes, because there's unlikely to be meaningful relief on the, on the underlying substance, it's very important to have some sort of process in place to ensure that the decision maker has access to all the relevant information, right? So, no, I'm not a threat. Um, uh, no, I'm not the person you think I am. Um, I've actually given up on jihad, and now I work for counter-radicalization. Don't hold me responsible. But, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, um, and you know, it's it's not clear that the procedures available are, are, are sufficient to allow for that you know, uh, exculpatory information to be made available to the decision maker. Great. Time for one more. Uh, Miriam. Thank you. A uh, quick point. Is the revocation of citizenship allowed for non-dual citizens in the U.S.? Uh, sorry, U.S. revoking the citizenship of, of whom? No, of U.S. citizens that don't have another citizenship. Because that's the issue in, in Europe. Yeah, it's now becoming allowed, but only for dual citizens that right. will not become stateless. Right, right. I actually don't know. I, Bill, do you know? The answer is no. Right. The answer is no. All right. So, so no, no revocation. No revocation. No. Yeah. Absent a, well, go ahead. Peter, you have a comment? Yes, uh, I mean, with the, uh, I have a comment on a lot of things, but <laughs> on that very, one very specific point, and it, it's not always something that makes me uh, popular. It's a, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a sort of populist demand, you know, we'll revoke your citizenship and out of sight, out of mind. But the reality is, these people, by revoking their citizenship, you're not making these people go away. They will turn up somewhere eventually. And I think that it's not a good measure because you're passing on essentially the problem to another country, to someone else, wherever, yeah. wherever they will turn up eventually. If every country does that, we're back to square one. And I don't think it solves anything. And personally, as a citizen, I, you know, I do think Britain should be responsible for the people who radicalized in Britain. It should eventually actually own up to its responsibility, and so it should be for every other country. I don't think it's a solution at all, to be honest. Let's, let's move to down under and find out how Australia responds to this problem. Professor Greg Rose. I refuse to go anywhere without my phone. Uh, thank you very much, Bill and Daphne, for uh, inviting me and enabling me to participate again in this uh, wonderful workshop. 
new battlefields old laws. When I first read about it in the Jerusalem Post in 2006, I contacted Boaz and he told me to contact Bill and uh, it's been uh, one of the highlights of my academic career to be involved in these cusp issues. So, foreign terrorist fighters down under. What's there to say? I was asked to give an Australian perspective. And there are particular, uh, Aust- oh, I should mention maybe the, the title. So it's Antipodes to Antioch. Uh, Antioch being the southern tip of Turkey, which was once a uh, centre for uh, uh, Hellenistic uh, Judaism. And Antipodes means the opposite pole, and it's another name for down under, uh, which is uh, the land of Oz. So uh, Resolution 2178 attracted Australian attention when we were on the Security Council until the end of last year and held the presidency in November and our Foreign Minister, we call our Secretary of State a Foreign Minister because we never see them, uh, uh, chaired an open debate on uh, counter-terrorism on November the 19th looking at the implementation of resolutions 2170 and 2178, and a later debate on implementing sanctions uh, was held under our watch. So Australia took some initiatives in terms of preparing papers on implementation and raising relevant questions. A question that I wanted to raise that, in fact, David raised, and I'll leave this as an issue for you maybe to follow up in questions is whether we don't see an increasing decline in democratic process through the legislative function of the Security Council that it's been adopting because it's only 15 members. The fact that there were 104 supporting states certainly gives greater legitimacy to that resolution but This is a phenomenon which is relatively recent because when we had the international uh, criminal tribunals established for Rwanda and Yugoslavia, they were legislative actions, creating courts and a whole statute system under a Chapter 7 decision of the Security Council. And when 1373, Resolution 1373, was adopted after 9-11, it based itself upon the existing counter-terrorism conventions calling upon states to ratify them, whereas 2178 is a completely new legislative regime adopted by the fiat of the Security Council. And I think it's open to debate whether that might in fact improve democratic accountability because at least you have adults in the room and five of them have a veto as compared to General Assembly uh, decision-making patterns. But it certainly moves us far away from the consensus premise of international law, which is that states contract together of their own free will in adopting laws, whether by treaty or through customary Practice, And this is a trend which is worrying to me, at least, for example, in the case Australia brought and succeeded in, in the International Court of Justice last year in March, challenging Japan over illegal whaling. One of the judges, Justice Trindad, based his reasoning upon uh, opinio sive necessitatis. In other words, the judge thinks it's necessary and therefore the customary law exists. So there's an increasing centralization of power within the UN system which is mandating new laws without the consensus premise. That's an observable trend and one worth discussing. So Australia's connections with uh, military action in the Middle East go back to the 1917 Battle of Beersheba that will celebrate its centenary uh, in two years time where there was a, a light horse brigade charge that took Beersheba from the Turks. We also, during that First World War, had our first foreign sourced terrorist attack when Turks working at a mine in central Australia on New Year's Day after a a fatwa was called by the the, uh, head of the caliphate Uh, for Muslims to rise against the West, which were attacking the Ottoman Caliphate, uh, went up onto a hill and uh, started shooting New Year's Day picnickers just outside the town of Broken Hill, killing four people. In more modern times, we have 500 army trainers currently in Iraq and are participating in the international coalition bombing ISIS and have been invited by President Obama to partake also in the uh, bombing campaign in Syria, although we're currently considering the legality of that without a uh, UN um, 
resolution basis. So that's state action. At the private actor level, you have private security uh, and military companies operating in the region and, of course, the private volunteers. And what's the difference between them, uh, one might ask, because these private security and military companies have been called mercenaries, as have the um, volunteers. So I'll come back to that momentarily. Um, why have the volunteers gone? Uh, if they don't like surfing and hanging 10 at the edge of the surfboard on the waves off Bondi Beach is just a little bit beyond, then one has to find an alternative utopia. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> post Facebook pictures, here we have uh, a, a little moniker by uh, uh, Zainab Sharouf, aged 14. She's one of the girls there holding a, an AK-47. She writes, she's just chilling in the Khalifa, love and life. So we have a, a movement of uh, young people from urban centres looking uh, for something that, as Peter said, empowers them. And they're not necessarily well equipped to do that. Our first uh, fatalities were a 22-year-old Tyler Casey and Amira Karoum, who had just married, gone off to Syria and uh, were uh, killed in a fight between ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra within a week of arriving. And uh, interestingly, he came from a broken family and had come from the US back to Australia. And I think that's a theme that tends to, to recur. There are a range of uh, identified uh, individuals that have gone where there's been discontent in the backyard and have gone to seek this uh, utopia. The figures are, as again, as Peter pointed out, not terribly uh, clear. But uh, the most recent press release by the Prime Minister refers to 160 Australians are fighting for ISIS and Jabal Nusra, or at least suspected, certainly 90 clearly identified, 20 that have returned after fighting, 60 have had their passports cancelled, and 100 to 150 based in Australia are providing support through funding, uh, recruitment and so on. And they come mostly from common urban centres in southwest Sydney, near the suburb of Blacktown and Auburn, or from Melbourne, the northeastern suburbs of uh, Craigieburn and um, Broadmeadows, and also a few from other capitals, Perth and, and Brisbane. But Aussie jihadists are getting ahead in the world. Uh, Mohammed El Amar was struck by a drone uh, not because he was a high-value target, I think, but because he was accompanying uh, one on June the 22nd. His wife, Fatima, and three children were stopped at the border when they were seeking to exit Australia, so they couldn't join him despite their wish to do so. So he married Zainab, who had posted how much she was love and life, and she was aged 13 at the time. She's now a pregnant widow and the daughter of the best friend of Muhammad Al-Amar, who is in the picture below him, Khaled Sharouf whose um, uncle was uh, convicted of terrorism in uh, Sydney and whose wife, a convert, Tara Nettleton, and their five children are together with him in, um, in Syria. And he's, he's, that photo of his son made world headlines. The preponderance of Australian terrorist fighters that have gone to Syria have been Lebanese from the suburbs of southwest Sydney, often related to each other and uh, involved in other terrorist plots uh, for which some have been convicted. So there are those uh, close uh, local links. And so Khaled Sharouf's brother and father have both been uh, convicted of uh, political violence related crimes. And there seems to be a, a range of characterizations of these people. You've got your gangsters, your Sharia gangsters, drawing on rapper culture, and the naifs who go as idealists. And it, it struck me uh, as ironic that this anti-Western worldview is created by the West, because it largely comes out of the conspiracy, well, this is my postulation, and it's certainly open to challenge, that Hollywood, my colleagues at university, the majority of the press are into conspiracy theory and the evils of Western government, and this is imbibed by the uh, younger generation that goes to fight it. So Jake Bellardi was 15 when he converted to Islam, again from a broken family. 
Uh, and he was uh, cannon fodder, a suicide bomber who uh, died at the age of 18 in a bombing that apparently didn't kill anybody except himself. And you have perhaps in that photo a good contrast between the gangster rapper and the idealistic naïf uh, working together. In terms of the Australian statistics compared uh, worldwide, if there are 20 or, as Peter has pointed out, after a recent spike, 25,000 foreign terrorist fighters, uh, Australians would make up only uh, 1%. The uh, connections uh, between them and terrorist plots in Australia for returning fighters have already been established. I mean, a series of arrests for preparations for a plot in Operation Neath in 2009. The Somali Al-Shabaab uh, um, veterans were involved. Uh, and Afghani Mujahideen in a plot against the 2000, year 2000 Olympics. And so in its Security Council uh, presidency role, Australia identified that we need more data on causes and the scale of the problem on how to coordinate internationally, develop a counter-narrative against the ideological uh, drivers of uh, this phenomenon, and that would involve engaging civil society. I suppose, again, this is the 30,000 feet view. And uh, some location within the UN that leads on CVE, which might be what the uh, CTED is doing, but perhaps not fully equipped to do. Uh, at this stage. At home, we've got uh, recent amendments to legislation, but legislation has been continually growing at a, at a hectic rate and amended since 2002. In June, we appointed a national coordinator for counterterrorism that would focus on countering uh, violent extremism and adopted a CVE strategy. There's been a counterterrorism white paper since 2010, and I, I won't spend uh, uh, too much uh, time on that other than to uh, note that uh, part of this, uh, the whole CVE phenomenon is attempting to, to deal with the lone wolf uh, problem and how to prevent problems before they, that such problems before they arise. <clears throat> In relation to countering violent extremism, I again might slip to the bottom of that slide just to raise one more question because um, although the Australian expenditure on counterterrorism has uh, uh, risen dramatically over the past uh, decade and a half, the idea of funding violent uh, extremism counter strategies through putting money into the community, calling for tenders, for programs, is something that's only two years old. And the government has announced its intention to discontinue this program, considering it on current indicators to be ineffective. And uh, coming as I do from uh, an environmental law uh, background, we have what we call environmental impact assessment, where there is a standard, actually was pioneered in the US Environment Protection Act in 1970, that requires all major developments to be assessed for their impacts on the environment. And yet when we pr provide assistance and funding and programs, we don't look at their impacts on violent extremism or terrorism. And so the, one of the criticisms of the internally driven criticisms of the Australian grants program was that the parties that it was going to and who were tendering for funds were saying, well, we're going to stop foreign fighters from going, but we're still Islamists. We're just not violent and uh, there was some doubt as to whether that was actually uh, the case and hence the current suspension of the program. Now if we move to criminal offences and the uh, recent amendments adopted in November last year, uh, the um, Foreign Fighters Act uh, was adopted in, 19, in 2014 which defines hostile activity as uh, activity intended to overthrow or intimidate the public or attack officials or destroy the property of a foreign country. And the sentences are very dramatic. Life imprisonment for uh, hostile activity or preparing for it. Recruiting, 25 years maximum sentence. Or travel to a designated area where a terrorist organization operates, 10 years. <clears throat> Exceptions can also 
be declared by the minister, and this becomes an interesting matter when we think about the uh, foreign groups who we consider to be the good guys. Two areas have been designated in al Raqqa and uh, Mosul. Uh, they are um, designated by the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs. And the same legislation, amended earlier legislation, which was the um, uh, Mercenaries and Foreign Recruitment Act, which made uh, it a crime to be a mercenary or to recruit persons to fight in foreign militaries. And so it remains a crime to recruit for foreign militaries, uh, subject to a penalty of up to 10 years imprisonment, but exceptions can be declared. And so that's of interest here because recruiting for the IDF is one of those exceptions and the French Foreign Legion uh, the other. It's not actually an offence to serve in a foreign uh, state's military. So, for example, if a Greek Australian at the age of 18 goes to Greece and is drafted in because he's also a, he's a dual national, it's not an offence to serve in the Greek army, uh, just as it wouldn't be in the Israeli army. But it all seems a bit symbolic. We've got these heavy penalties, life imprisonment, 25 years imprisonment, but the mercenaries legislation was around since 1978 and there was never a prosecution under it, even when 300 Australian Serbs and Croats went to fight in Yugoslavia. And even though we have a, a range of Australian uh, private military and security companies, with 22 with headquarters in Australia, and 9% uh, globally have offices in Australia, there's never been a prosecution under uh, the Act. Not easy to prosecute either, obtaining evidence from foreign jurisdictions, but maybe the situation is changing now with a um, <clears throat> first prosecution against Adam Brookman, uh, a convert who uh, goes now under the name Abu Ibrahim, who is also a nurse, but uh, claims he was engaging in humanitarian work in Syria, uh, but has been identified, and of course these people identify themselves through their Facebook postings as acting as an ISIS guard and reconnaissance uh, person. Jamie Williams, on the other hand, went to fight for the Kurdish YPG. And the legislation doesn't distinguish at this stage because no special exemption has been declared which side uh, a party is uh, fighting for. It's a crime if they go to a declared area to fight, full stop. But puzzlingly, there are a couple of people who have been, who aren't being high profile, who ha haven't been prosecuted. Uh, George Hamas went to work uh, to fight for the Assyrian Dwek Nosha, and he's got Facebook postings of himself with a gun, came back, there have been inquiries, no prosecutions yet. And Matt Gardner, was actually president of the Australian Labor Party in the Northern Territory of Australia, so a senior political figure, a, an Australian Defence Force veteran who went to uh, Syria, but it seems, at least on the information that he's provided, that he was only nursing and outside of the declared zone area uh, to provide assistance to the Kurds. And of course there are those who are not returning to be prosecuted because they've been killed in the fighting. And in fact, the first Australian that was killed fighting for the Kurds uh, was Ashley Johnson on the left there, and uh, Reese Harding was the second. Uh, he uh, made a, a video which I wanted to show you here. YPG fighter Reese Harding, originally from Australia with pseudonym Bagok Sarhad, lost his life on 27 June 2015. Hi, my name is Rhys Harding. I'm from the Gold Coast, Australia. Um, I volunteered to join the YPJ to fight against Daesh. I believe the Western world is not doing enough to help. Uh, the Kurdish people are lovely people. I've never met such a nice group of people. Um, if anything happens to me, parents, I love you. Brother, I love you. And Isabel, I love you. Rhys Harding is the second Australian to lose his life fighting alongside the YPG against ISIS gangs. The first Australian was Ashley Kent Johnston. Now I'd better move quickly, I'm just coming to the end here. Uh, the last piece of legislation is an amendment to the Australian citizenship law to 
strip dual nationals of Australian citizenship, and it's been criticised for the breadth of its scope and for its uh, symbolism as uh, as distinct from uh, uh, actual uh, preventive value. So, for example, Tara Nettleton and her five children, the mother and children of Khaled Sharouf, questions have been raised if they want to come back to Australia, would they still be citizens um, if they wanted to come back? And uh, there's, uh, her indications are that she has no intention of, of coming back, but there is the phenomenon of returning terrorist uh, fighters. And um, I might... Uh rather than describe the act, uh, deal with that in questions and simply finish with these uh, issues that I uh, uh, put to you. Uh, should we be uh, shifting responsibility to other countries? Peter has expressed the view uh, that we shouldn't. And uh, how practically uh, implementable are uh, these laws concerning prosecutions and stripping of, of nationality? Are governments and is the Australian government grandstanding for votes? Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Time for a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, this might be a question that's appropriate for more than one of your speakers, but one of the things I was thinking about when um, Professor Sales was addressing us is that the US, for instance, has the Patriot Act, which allows it to not only deal with what US citizens do abroad, but what anybody does abroad. So if I want to uh, send US dollars, which are... Um, I suppose, uh, illegal dollars from me as a Brit to somebody else who's a French person, it's deemed to go through New York and it's deemed to be an offence in New York which the US can then do something about. So my question really is, is there a way in which whether it's the US, Australia, Britain could use something equivalent to the uh, material support uh, statute that you spoke about so that if I, as a Brit, do something which would be in breach of that, perhaps I am potentially endangering US lives or, or Australian lives or British lives, even if I'm not in Britain. Um, is there a way in which worldwide that would garner support to try to use legislation not only extra territorially, but across um, all citizens. Who has the great answer? <laughs> Maybe David does. Um, here, here's the, uh, the, the, the problem. The problem is that um, once you move from, let's say, Security Council resolutions that set the principle you should criminalize certain actions. Countries have differing views on almost any um, possible way to do it. And the views are different because first countries have different constitutional regimes, different uh, legal systems, different traditions, and also the tendency of countries to first work with what they have. It's not that the, the day after the adoption of 2178, countries started, okay, let's change our laws. That was not the first reaction of member states. The first reaction of member states, and rightly so, was to see, are we covered by our existing laws? And I think it was mentioned earlier that from the US, if I may add, unsurprisingly, resolution 2178 did not require any changes in laws because they had what they thought is full implementation of the resolution. It is true also for many other countries which say we have the laws, but the laws they have were not designed by the concept of foreign terrorist fighters, were designed, as in the case of Australia, in, uh, for a completely different context. They're just applicable to this context. So why create new laws when you think 
that your laws are uh, answering or making you in full implementation of, uh, of, of the resolution. The problem is that um, when countries are working with different uh, concepts, as they do now, um, it's much more difficult for them to cooperate with each other. Because for the, for the basis for international cooperation, at least when it comes to legal cooperation, is that countries have the same uh, benchmark. That we, uh, both of us, understand that this uh, offense is, uh, this, this person committed an offense under our, our laws. The other country said, yes, this, offense, this person committed offense under our, our laws. And then we could correct. But when countries work with different concepts, for example, the Australian model, that instead of saying you're not allowed to travel here or you're not allowed to travel there, but instead designate specific regions, no matter what the reason you're going, you're just not supposed to be there, is completely different from a, from a concept that said you're not allowed to go anywhere if this is the purpose of your travel. And that if I may add, mm -hmm. is uh, something that could and probably is creating many challenges for law enforcement and for judicial authorities in those countries to cooperate uh, with each other. That's great. On the theory that we always save the best for last, <laughs> Daphne, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your amazing presentations. Uh, very enlightening, and uh, I'm very grateful. And I'm actually very happy that we picked this topic. I think it's a very productive conversation. And um, and um, and so thank you really to all the speakers and to all of you who came. Um, so. Um, at the outset and before I even say anything else, I want to uh, reiterate something I've already said in other fora. Um, so David has heard this before, and I think some of you have as well. I, I really do genuinely believe that uh, United Nations Security Resolutions 2178 is a remarkable achievement, not only in diplomacy, but in law. Uh, and in the fight against terrorism. So really none of what I'm about to say should be interpreted as undermining this really profound belief that, that I think uh, a major step, um, a stepping stone, uh, this, resolu this resolution is, is truly a major milestone. Um, the fact that the international community really stepped up to condemn and to combat the recruit recruitment of foreign nationals is, uh, by the Islamic State is, is really truly remarkable. So. Uh, after having said that, um, and because, uh, you know, patting ourselves on the back is not always the most productive thing to do, uh, I'd like to express a word of caution. And um, the word of caution that I'm about to express is, is related to uh, the YPG volunteers. And basically what I want to do now with you is I want to show how the case of the YPG volunteers actually underscores some of the weaknesses in our approach and in the emerging legal framework governing foreign fighters. So part of the reason uh, why the resolution actually succeeded in garnering so much support on, of so many states in such an unprecedented fashion is because it is focused on one specific case, the foreign fighters who travel to join or to assist ISIS. And, uh, and, and even though, and we've talked about this uh, this morning, history has seen many other instances of foreign intervention or foreign fighting. And in a general matter, those instances were also looked down upon by international law. And even though we also had an entire regime outlawing mercenaries, uh, which was developed in the 1980s, uh, uh, basically what happened in the 1980s and the 1990s is that, uh, is that the international community said in the clearest way possible that participating in someone else's war is unacceptable. It is illegitimate. So, and the reason why it was declared illegitimate and mercenaries were turned into outlaws, even though this was not a very efficient regime, mind you, but nevertheless, I think here the core concept is what I want to highlight. What was the really underlying justification for, un for outlawing mercenaries is that they were regarded as providing some for an, as, as ex, you know, providing an illegitimate form of intervention in another state's affair. 
And I think it's important to be reminded of that, even though, of course, the, what the resolution wanted to do, and it does that very clearly, is to carve out all of these other categories from the resolution. And, uh, but I think, again, the, the justification is something that was important for me to, to remind you of, and I want to build on that uh, in a few um, uh, minutes that, that, that come. So among those that were excluded from the resolution, one might think, or one would think, or perhaps they really are excluded from the resolution, are the volunteers who have joined the People's Defense Unit, also known as YPG, the Syria Kurdish militia, which is fighting against ISIS and not alongside ISIS. So what we have is, and the terminology here is quite interesting, we have foreign fighters, um, like those who join ISIS or al-Nusra, that are considered as, as doing something illegal, and um, we have foreign volunteers, like those who join the YPG or the KRG, which, uh, you know, here I'm kind of simplifying just to, to provide the contrast, but we feel a lot more sympathetic uh, to, to those. So because the YPG volunteers and other good foreign volunteers in the region are excluded from the legal framework governing the bad foreign fighters, uh, the question arises about um, what exactly it is that sets them apart. Um, and I'd like to argue that there is no objective criteria that justifies this difference in treatment. The case of the YPG volunteer is not as clear-cut as it has been presented to us, and it exposes an important weakness, as I said, of the emerging framework. And namely, I would argue that, it's, uh, that the regime that's emerging rests more on our conception of what is just and what is unjust war than on any tangible criteria. The YPG, including its all-female branch, the Women's Defense Unit, I had to mention that, is one of three major Kurdish militias that are operating in the Middle East alongside the PKK in Turkey and the Peshmerga in Iraq. The YPG is particularly active in the northern uh, part of Syria, but that here I'm not teaching you anything, and what I want to talk about more interestingly for our purposes is the recruiting patterns and the modest operandi of the YPG. So here on the screen I put something that appears on their Facebook page where they're essentially calling for people to join them, but that's a little bit misleading in fact, because they are quite selective and exclusive in how they take foreign volunteers. Um, they, they really um, make those volunteers uh, go through major steps of recruitment. There is a screening that is completed. Not everyone who wants to volunteer with the YPG and fight against ISIS is in, uh, eventually accepted uh, within uh, the group. Um, so that's why most of the YPG is actually local Kurdish people. And when we compare the phenomenon of foreign fighters to foreign volunteers, what we realize is that the foreign volunteers, of course, the phenomenon pales in terms of pales in terms of uh, the scope when we compare it to the foreign fighters. We're not talking at all about similar numbers. It's very important to note that. So I'm using it more as a conceptual uh, issue than as a, a, a kind of like a quantitative, I guess, uh, uh, argument. But what we, even though we don't see a very active recruitment or we don't see everyone getting accepted within the YPG, what we can foresee in the future is that a continuous, a steady flow of foreign volunteers will continue to be attracted uh, to uh, groups like the YPG and to offer their services. So it's not, a, it's not huge in terms of scope, but it's likely to continue steadily uh, in the future. So now I want to go back to the little clip that uh, Greg uh, showed us earlier about the YPG fighter. And I want to ask you how many of you felt sympathetic to his plight, right? He is an Australian national who leaves his family behind, and he goes to fight ISIS because, I quote him, right, the Western world is not doing enough. So how many of you feel sympathetic to that, that plight? I would assume that many of you do. Uh, and perhaps now that I've started talking, you feel less sympathetic. It's also possible. But <laughs> let's say yesterday. How sympathetic did you feel yesterday about them? So. Uh, what I want to show is that states have actually expressed very similar preferences towards YPG fighters. And I think it's important to, to remember this. So the UK has declared that joining ISIS is actually very different uh, to joining the YPG. There is a fundamental difference between fighting for the Kurds and joining ISIS. UK law makes provisions to deal with different conflicts in different ways. Fighting in a foreign war is not automatically an offense, but will depend on the nature of the conflict and the individual's own activities. 
Okay. Uh, then we have the Australian example where uh, it was actually said that the travel ban won't apply to fighters against ISIL. So as Greg was kind of, uh, um, um, you know, uh, mentioning to us, there is an exception that's being carved out for them. And, uh, and here at the end, you see the picture of Gil Rosenberg, who is an Israeli Canadian national. Uh, very, uh, a lot of people have heard of her, especially in Israel, who came, who, who flew to fight alongside the YPG and came back in, uh, to Israel. So, and it's actually also the Dutch government who's made clear that joining the YPG is not a crime in and of itself. So in fact, the few YPG volunteers that have come back to their country of origin, and Gil Rosenberg is really, uh, the, she embodies this, I think, in the best possible way, have found it relatively easy to do so. They haven't faced any kind of the obstacles or complications that, that the bad foreign fighters have faced. And so the discrepancy between the treatment of the good foreign fighters fighting against ISIS on one hand and that of the bad ones fighting alongside ISIS in my mind, and I think that's my word of caution, sets a dangerous precedent. Um, it undermines our existing policies. It gives the impression that we are really going here about our ideological preferences. Um, and look, I think what's particularly alarming is that while the YPG's uh, objectives or policies or um, nationalistic goals align with that of the coalition at the moment, uh, that might not be the case in the long run. And, and, and I think... Um, you know, even even if that's not the case, right? If you look at the YPG records, uh, they've actually been criticized recently for violating human rights, for hiring child soldiers. So I'm, I was thinking, and they haven't been very accepting of criticism. They're like, we are fighting ISIS. Let us fight how we want to fight. Uh, we understand you're concerned about international humanitarian law, but we have a fight and you're not really helping us fight it. So let us do it how we think is best. it is best done. So they don't really take the criticism about the law. And I'm, what I'm thinking is that let's say they become a really extremist group group really also committing serious atro atrocities, will we feel as sympathetic to having our own people join their, their plight? So I think all of this, um, you know, either one of these aspects could really have damaging consequences for the legitimacy and credibility of the framework. Um, and I think what this case of the YPG volunteers really does is that it calls into questions the very justifications underlying uh, the emerging uh, legal regime. So what I want to do now is that um, I want to reflect, uh, so, so sorry, so what we, when we take 2178, what it tells us, you know, it, it kind of like within this uh, uh, line of thinking is that the international community says very clearly, joining ISIS constitutes, uh, is illegitimate. That's a group you cannot join. So what I want to do now is I want to think about what are the groups that we can join and the groups that we cannot join as volunteer. And I want to argue that it's a continuum. Okay, so... Um, ISIS, of course, would be on the left side of the continuum as a group that cannot be joined. That's obvious from the resolution. At the other end of the continuum, I would put, and Greg also mentioned that, an American Jew joining the IDF uh, as a volunteer. And um, I would argue, and again, uh, not everyone might agree, but let's assume that we agree at least on those two sides of the continuum as one being illegitimate and one being a legitimate group to join. If I was going to put al-Nusra on this continuum, I would probably put it next to ISIS. And um, now um, it gets a little bit more of a controversial part of this continuum. Let's think about Ukraine or Syria, uh, Turkish army or the Russian army. Those are state armies that are not, you know, at least in terms of their um, uh, you know, as a group, they are not different from the Israeli army. They belong to a state. And so if I wanted to have any kind of consistency with my own self, right, I would have to put them there together with Israel. So now you may begin to disagree with me, if you haven't before, and, and uh, you may disagree that I, I am equating essentially the Israeli army with uh, joining Assad's forces or jo joining the, the Russia forces. And, and I can see that. I'm not uh, arguing against that. But what I'm saying is that assuming you disagree with that, what it means is that you probably... Um, don't view the nature of the group as the criteria for determining which group can be joined and which group cannot be joined. So apparently that means that there's something else out there that we need to, uh, and we need to find out what it is. So that is not, if you disagree with that, the, the criteria upon which we can distinguish between those groups. Uh, but I'll go back to that in a minute. Now, let's go back to the YPG. Where do we put the YPG? So. I put the YPG somewhere in the middle. I don't have enough room on the slide, so of course the distances may not be accurate. But the YPG in the middle, and I would put the KRG, um, the Kurdish regional government, which is much more politically organized and much more, of course, recognized uh, 
than the YPG, and that those, it, it has an armed forces, uh, the Peshmerga, and now we'd have to place those on the right of the YPG in a continuum, uh, meaning closer to states, because this entity more resembles the state than do the other ones on the left side of the continuum. It gets more complicated with Hezbollah, the Assyrian Christian militia, and Hamas. Where do I put those? Are those legitimate groups to join? Can a, foreign, a foreigner join these groups or not? So the question that I'm trying to get to, and I know it's confusing, but that's actually the point, is that on what basis do we decide that joining one of these groups is more legitimate than joining another? Um, I want to try to uh, dig a little bit further. Here's, here are the potential criteria that I've identified, and again, um, you can maybe think about others. I'll add some ad additional criteria later on. But what are the possible criteria that make foreign participation legitimate or not? So one obvious criteria when we talk about ISIS is the designation as a terrorist group. Is that what makes it illegitimate to join ISIS? And assuming we don't have that, then all of the other groups can be joined. If that is the touchstone of illegitimate participation, right, it means that except for ISIS, we agree that all of these other groups can be joined by foreigners. And I don't think we do agree with that. Therefore, that means that this is not the touchstone uh, that we're looking for. Another potential criteria, which I mentioned earlier, is the nature of the group. Uh, under this logic, joining a state army would be acceptable, but joining a militia would not. So that has a lot of advantages as, term of, as, a, as a criteria to say if it's a state, it's okay. If it's something else, it's not. At least it's you have clarity. But it's a little bit formalistic, especially in today's world where states are taking some strange forms. Um, and, uh, and it would make the case of joining Hezbollah or Hamas, which are hybrid groups, hybrid organizations, as, as a volunteer, that would, I would really not know what to do with them. Um, so we might be tempted to regard volunteering as acceptable when the volunteer shares some kind of ethnic or religious or ideological roots with the group. And I think the motivations that Peter showed us earlier really come to show that, that there is always this kind of like identification. It comes from some place. And especially in a world where we're not getting monetary compensation, it means that necessarily there is some other motivation for joining. So if you adopt that as the touchstone of what constitutes legitimate participation, then you can basically justify any foreign participation. Then we should view all of these as acceptable. And we don't either. Ultimately, what I'm trying to say is that none of these criteria succeeds in ration rationalizing international law's take on foreign participation. None of them provides a satisfactory justification about why it might be okay under international law to join the YPG, but not okay to join ISIS. Um, and what I think it shows us is a very strong connection actually to just war theory, um, which regards certain wars are, as being worth fighting for, and just in terms of, uh, uh, of our involvement and others that are unjust and subject, therefore, to different rules. What's interesting is that for so many years, if not centuries, international law has tried to detach itself from just war theory. But when I see this, I can't help but thinking that this might be, uh, that it might be coming back to the, to the fore. Um, if we're thinking about additional criteria, and here I'll be very quick, but basically I think the state criteria is a very worthwhile criteria to think about. I think uh, neutrality is the individual of the nationality of one of the parties to the conflict. I think it's also a valuable criteria because I think when the neutrality of the state is compromised, that's, where, that's a point where we might start thinking that we're going into illegitimate participation. And if we go back to the justification underlying the mercenaries regime, which I mentioned earlier, that was the whole point. Mercenaries were outlaws because they were challenging this neutrality. Because there were people who had no connection to the fighting who came and fought in those conflicts. So I think we need to keep that in the back of our mind somehow. I think the monetary compensation, which David mentioned as really the one major criteria distinguishing between mercenaries and and, and ISIS and others is, is, is interesting, but because none of these get money, I don't believe that it helps us that much further either. Um, so uh, this brings me to uh, my conclusion. So when we think back about what uh, Cameron said or what Harper said about the case of the foreign, of the foreign volunteers joining uh, the YPG, it's not as straightforward as we 
uh, as they portray it to us. I think our, our innate sense of justice is not sufficient to explain what it is exactly that we are doing it here and why joining ISIS is a crime and you can sit in prison for the rest of your life or, and joining the YPG is, is, you, turn, makes you into a hero. Um, I think... Um, I think we need to do a, a better job at rationalizing what it is exactly that bothers us in, 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 this, in this process. And, uh, and it's hardly satisfactory, I think, what we have right now in terms of a, to, to form the basis of lawmaking or from the basis of policymaking. Um, and I want to give you one example of where I think, uh, to conclude, of where I think this uh, is, is happening in other places. And I think we have every reason to believe that it will happen also in the context of foreign fighters. Um, the UK was prosecuting a Swedish national for providing support to Syrian rebels. The prosecution was going forward, and then it turned out that um, that very same group was actually receiving support by the UK. So the UK was prosecuting this, this, this Swedish national for being involved in a group which we, it was itself secretly uh, uh, arming and, 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 and helping. And so I think that it's, you know, it's, it's almost funny, but I think in an, in, in a time where the sense of terrorism are, are shifting like this, and at a time where we're trying to come up with tools and mechanisms to implement Resolution 2178, I think, um, what we can do at best is keep in, in mind the case of the YPG volunteers and how they challenge the underlying logic um, that we've uh, created. Thank you. Opportunity for a brief response from David. Um, it's not exactly a, res a, a, a response, but I feel uh, um, an urge to uh, to um, to respond, whatever. Call it respond. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so, thank you, Daphne, for for raising um, what we talked earlier about the complexity of this mm. resolution that. It's very typical to Security Council resolutions because they are not just legal text. Anyone who looks at the Security Council resolution like the way you would look at a law or a convention mm -hmm. or a treaty misses the point because Security Council resolutions are legal and political texts. And any interpretation of Security Council resolution or exercise like the one you, um, you saw elegantly as suggested, must take into account that the tool, even though it has legally binding authority, is first and foremost a political tool. And we could see that complexity, and we have to take into account. Another big question that rises us is who is authorized to interpret Security Council resolution? Security Council does not interpret its own resolution. It issues them, and that's it. Um, we at CTED or the CTC do not see ourselves as uh, providing authoritative interpretation of the resolution. There is no international court that uh, provides authoritative interpretation. So it leaves for many, uh, for every state and every court and every constitutional court in every state to, and I'm waiting for the time that the resolution will reach the German constitutional court because I think it will be very, very interesting. Uh, uh, time and we could see also times of conflict between Security Council resolutions and EU law, as we've seen in the case of the 1267 resolution and all the challenges that we're facing with CADI. Um, that being said, I want to add f how we look on the different uh, uh, categories of situations, um, and I want to say few few points from from our perspective. First is that. We never understood the resolution to be a comprehensive tool. Resolution 2178 was never meant or never developed or negotiated as a comprehensive tool to the phenomena of foreign fighters. It meant from the start to deal with a very specific phenomena, and I would say in a very targeted way. We won't solve all the problems of all the conflicts, but we have a, a very uh, an emerging threat that nobody right now knows what to do, and this is exactly the situation where the Security Council steps in and said, first let's do something and then continue. Um, and the key to understanding, at least from my view, 
what the Security Council deals with is the terrorist intention. What is the reason the person is traveling? From our perspective, it matters less who it joins. It can join ISIS, it can join any group, it can even decide not to join any group. If the purpose of the travel is to commit or perpetrate or plan or participate in a terrorist attack somewhere else, it falls under 2178. So it doesn't really matter. What happens, and this goes back to the conversation we had earlier, is that for most member states, the immediate tool were the tools they already had. And these tools were linked to designations to existing designations. And therefore, it immediately came, since ISIS or Al-Qaeda were designated by, mo by probably all member states, it immediately made travel for the purpose of joining ISIL criminalized. Uh, but this is not what the resolution necessarily said. If a country, for example, the case of Israel, designates um, Hezbollah, then a person who travel for the purpose of joining um, Hezbollah would fall under 2178, at least in my understanding. If another country uh, designate IRA or uh, FARC or whoever it may be, then traveling for the purpose of joining that organization would fall under 2178. PKK. Sorry? PKK. PKK would be the same, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so this is the key in my view. And I want to add one more thing. Being aware of the all these complexities that Daphna so rightly mentioned that could come up from so many dire directions and views. Um, one of the things that came up quite critical, again, in the days uh, after the adoption of the resolution is to try to lower it from the level of 30,000 feet to a level of 10,000 feet, and if possible, even 5,000 feet. And in this regard, the Council of Europe additional protocol does that exactly by giving a, 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 spe a specific context of what the resolution speaks about in a way that at least 47 uh, member states can agree. And then if one of them wants to go further or beyond, it can go, but no less than this core uh, uh, principles. But clearly, I, I agree with you. We will have many, many more challenges. And the fact that it's a hybrid legal and political uh, tool could not prevent such uh, differences about what is what in the view of the powers is a just war, what is not, and uh, I, don't, I cannot elaborate further, but it clearly came in the negotiations by specific uh, member states, what they want to see inside, what clearly could not be inside for the resolution to pass. I think that one thing is clear that we're in the midst, perhaps, of a legal and political dialogue that will continue for some time. But please join me in thanking what has been a really wonderful panel here today. remind you all that this is not only Foreign Fighters Morning, but it's Foreign Fighters Day. Uh, so at 2 p.m. we will reconvene um, to actually uh, see how some of these challenges play out in a simulation that will be taking place uh, on campus. So I just read you the little blurb about the simulation. What's going on in the simulation is that the Islamic State continues to fight in Syria and in Iraq, launching attacks against civilians and soldiers, but sporadic attacks are also uh, spreading throughout the globe and including in Europe, where some foreign fighters are set to come back and an imminent attack is about to take place. Um, so we'll be talking about de-radicalization, we'll be talking about targeted killing, we'll be talking about constitutional guarantees and we look forward to seeing you at two. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, morning.